We're not quite starting, but can you all hear me in the back? Tom? Tom, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Are they logging into the regular service rooms? Okay, so um, if everyone could come to their seats, we're going to get started. So for this one, you can either use the uh, initial, um, the initial server that you were using over the last few days, or you can use the one that um, that you just used for the uh, SciTurk one. Uh, if you're having issues with one, try the other, and then if you're still having issues, uh, Slack me, please. Uh, so we're flying a little blind here just because switching back and forth between servers has caused some uh, just installation issues. And so just before we start, what I'd like to do is just um, 
ensure everybody has at least the uh, tutorial documents. Um, and so just to be safe, what I've done is I've uploaded them to a, to a new repository. I'm going to stick this URL into uh, Slack general and then just follow my instructions for what to do with it. You're going to go to Jupyter Hub. You're going to go to the, the terminal like you have been before through new terminal. Just make sure that you're in the root directory. And then all you have to do is git clone that URL. Um, so I already have it, but you shouldn't, and it should download. And uh, just raise your hand quickly if that just if that didn't work. Raise your hand quickly if it did work. Okay, so about five percent response rate. So I'll try. It. I'll give you like thirty seconds. Yep, sure thing. So if you are logged into the server, it should look something like this. You can go to new terminal that will pop open a new browser window. In that browser window, just make sure that you're in the root directory. You kind of have to be, but you can type ls and that will show you where you are. Um, and then there's just one command, which is git clone and then that URL that's pasted down there, which is https colon slash slash github.com slash my last name suchow slash algorithmic dash experimentation dash with dash dallinger dot git. And that'll just make sure that everybody has everything they could possibly need. Okay, one more try. If it, if it, if it hasn't worked yet, raise your hand. Okay, looking good. If it has worked, raise your hand. Okay, still not 100% response rate, but looking good. Okay, so now that you have the stuff, what we're going to do is just like inside of this directory is all of the, all of the documents. It actually has a few folders inside of it. We're going to just start with part zero. This is arranged into three parts. The first one is on the idea, introducing the idea of experiments as algorithms. The second part, uh, it's zero index, so number one, is uh, an implementation of, of doing algorithmic experimentation using uh, a platform called Dallinger, which is cl quite closely related to SciTurk. And just about all of the stuff that you've learned about SciTurk applies directly to what we're going to be doing here. And then the, the last part, I want to talk about reproducibility, uh, a vision of reproducibility, and uh, talk about some data migration tools that might be helpful, given all the different kinds of uh, things that you've learned over the past few days. Uh, it's, it's one way to put, them all, put it all together and make sure that whatever tool you, you, you know of that's best for the job, you can use it with whatever data you might have. OK. So we're going to start with the notebook experiments as algorithms. And what I want you to note is that the methods that behavioral and social scientists use to answer questions about cognition and social behavior, they've really hardly changed over the past century. Um, they really often draw on experimental studies in brick and mortar labs. They sometimes use field observations and sometimes they use some kind of modeling through uh, mathematical equations or uh, simulation. What I find really interesting is that the experimental designs that were used way back in the early days of psychology, this is a picture of uh, Wilhelm Wundt's lab, um, really like the, the, first, the first experimental psychology lab, um, at least in, in the US. Um, uh, they, they really don't look all that foreign to, to, a, to a modern psychologist. There's some people sitting at a, a table, playing with some gadgets, uh, looking at a screen, making some judgments of some kind. Um, and that's a, that's a really standard way to do, to do psychology, even today. To test the hypothesis, you might randomly assign participants to, to different groups, the treatment or the control. You might manipulate one factor for one group but not the other, and observe whether they uh, behave differently as a result. Um, or if you want to understand how one factor affects some, the relationship between, between uh, two variables, you might ask each participant to, set, to judge a set of stimuli that vary along one variable and observe the, other, the impact uh, on the other by measuring it. Uh, in some ways, I mean really in many ways, these designs result from constraints on how experiments are conducted. And that's really because when you bring people into a laboratory, they often come for a fixed amount of time. You know, you can't have somebody 
come to the lab and only be there for, for five seconds. It, they, they usually have to be there for uh, what's determined by uh, maybe their undergrads, and so maybe they have to be there for a half an hour or for an hour to get credit. Um, and so it ends up making sense to have each person perform many trials of some fairly time-consuming task. Um, and importantly, because the experimenter, experiments are all run manually by the experimenter, reconfiguring anything about the experiment is pretty hard. Um, it's not easy to, to, to change group assignment on every trial or to, um, or to adaptively adjust the stimuli that you show people throughout the course of, of an experiment. Recently, behavioral and social scientists have really begun to move from brick and mortar laboratories to the web, uh, where participants are recruited through crowdsourcing platforms like Mechanical Turk, uh, which, we, which we've seen a few times, uh, in particular in the, in the previous session. And they use browsers to interact with uh, a web application that's hosted on a server somewhere. Uh, with SciTurk, maybe that's on your laptop. With other platforms, maybe that's uh, out, on, out on the cloud. What's key, though, is that the experiment designs that people typically use, um, even when doing crowdsourcing, are pretty much identical to the same kinds of experiments that they've done in the lab. There's a lot of benefits of using crowdsourcing platforms. You can access a, a diverse sample that really goes beyond what you can get in a typical undergraduate population at a university. Um, you can do rapid prototyping. Uh, Todd mentioned that the number of experiments you can run and, and how quickly you can get up, to get, up uh, get an experiment or a replication up and running is really, is really mind boggling. Um, and you can get higher throughput. Uh, just, in, in, you know, uh, just in the last session, we saw five participants um, go through an experiment in one hour, and that's already a pretty good throughput. And it wouldn't have been hard for him to just change the number from, from five to 50, and then we would have had ten, uh, tenfold throughput with no additional effort on, on the part of the experimenter. Uh, but even so, it hasn't changed the fundamental structure of an experiment. And that's really a missed opportunity. And that's because crowdsourced experiments can differ from traditional experiments in two really important ways. Uh, the first is that you can have participants come to the lab, uh, your, the online lab, and do whatever you want them to do. They can, they can make a single judgment where they just decide, you know, is this, does this, is this object, does it belong to this category or that, or that category? Or you can really make use of their time and you can have a participant come to the, lab, come to the online lab and participate in a long interactive uh, experiment where they read a story for two and a half hours and then fill out a detailed survey about it uh, and judge their comprehension. Um, the second thing that's important that, that can be different about crowdsourced experiments is that what you have one person do can depend on what you have other people do. You can learn from partial data and adaptively adjust the experiment in various ways. And importantly, because experiments are orchestrated by a computer rather than the experimenter, there's a lot of room for doing that customization. And really, you're mostly just limited by your imagination. You're not limited by the logistics. And so combining these two things, the ability to do tasks of whatever length you want and combine them and, and have, uh, have uh, adaptively adjust the structure of the experiment. You can think about a crowdsourced experiment as a complex, computationally mediated, adaptive, iterative procedure for gathering data, which is to say you can think about it as an algorithm. And so by taking this perspective, it becomes possible to ask, what are the right algorithms for studying human cognition and behavior um, or, 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 and social behavior? experiment design really becomes algorithm design. And so what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon um, is, is we're going to start by reviewing several experiment designs that are out there and posing them as algorithms, thinking about the ways in which they, they, they in actually implement algorithms. Next, we're going to talk about Dallinger, which is a, a laboratory automation system for the behavioral and social sciences. And we'll talk about how it can specifically be used for algorithm algorithmic experimentation. And finally, we'll talk about reproducibility of behavioral and social science experiments and its relationship to data handling. And I think this, this part is key, which is that you saw in SciTurk that you, you really get a big step forward by, by, um, by essentially defining your entire experiment in code. It means you don't have to worry about experimenter effects because the experiment, there is no, there is no experimenter that's injecting variation there. Um, and there's, there's lots of points along the way where you really, can, um, you, you really are pushing in the right direction of, of reproducible uh, experiments. What I'd like to talk about is essentially taking that to its logical extreme and asking how much of that can we actually automate? Can we get to a point where replicating an experiment in the behavioral or social sciences 
is not a, a, a big endeavor. It's not a hard thing. It's I hand you the code, you press a button, done. Um, and we'll talk about that as a, that as a vision and, and where the sticking point, points are. Um, on each of these uh, subsections, I have a little section of further reading at the bottom. These are just a couple things that either um, uh, that I think are just, they're, they're, they're usually quite related to whatever that section was on and they're good points to go for, for, for additional reading. Uh, so I have this like, uh, this GitHub repository called Awesome Crowdsourcing. There's this um, new thing that's happened over the past three or four years on GitHub where people create, you know, just lists of, of interesting examples of certain things. And so I've been putting together a list of interesting crowdsourcing uh, references. This has every behavioral platform I've been able to find. It's about 30 or 40 of them. It has several crowdsourcing platforms like Mechanical Turk, Crowdflower, Prolific Academic, um, and so on. It also has a few specific interesting examples of doing crowdsourcing that aren't necessarily experiments, um, but are maybe art projects. Uh, the second paper is uh, on human computation. It's a, it's, a, it's a different field, but it's very closely related to crowdsourcing. It is essentially the, a, a field, um, sometimes belonging to computer science or information science, that asks how could we arrange people into certain ways to, um, to perform computations? Um, and it, it's a, like one of the, one of the original uh, uh, parts of that field was, um, you've all seen uh, captures. I think I just have to fill one into uh, one of these, one of these uh, I think actually uh, in signing into Mechanical Turk today, it thought I was a fake account or something. And so it gave me uh, one of these captures where it has a, a bit of mangled text that I have to read you know, and, and fill in what it says. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a reCAPTCHA, which uh, is a, like a, it's a, a library system that essentially um, you have a pair of, of captures and uh, one of them is uh, computer generated, the other one's uh, scanned OCR from a, uh, it, um, is scanned from some kind of uh, digital document and you essentially are doing human OCR, often called reading. Um, but but um, <laughs> what's interesting is that by doing this at scale, you can actually essentially digitize documents that uh, make use of uniquely human capabilities, which at this point are on the verge of not being uniquely human. It's been, uh, it's been months and months since I've been able to solve <laughs> a reCAPTCHA on the first try. Okay, and then the last one is uh, a uh, CrowdML NIPS workshop paper on this topic of rethinking ex experiment design as algorithm design. Okay, so that's part one. Let's next go to a, an example of experiment design as algorithm design. And this is about A-B testing and clinical trials. And where this starts is in medicine. So there's this document, it's the Belmont Report. And what it does is it, spe it, it formalizes principles and standards of medical ethics. And the core conundrum is really that the doctor has a duty to the patient, um, but even so, and any kind, of, uh, any kind of medical intervention has some risk to the patient. And so the, the, the tension there is when you are doing some kind of medical intervention, for example, a clinical trial, and you note that the clinic, that, that trial happens to be having a negative impact on the, the patients, what do you do? On the one hand, you want to continue to figure out and, and collect more data to figure out, is it really having a negative impact? We want to learn so that in the future, what, we, we know whether this is a good medicine or whether this is a good intervention. On the other hand, you have a duty to the patient, and so there's a temptation or a tension to want to stop immediately, which is to say to make the decision and not get more information. Um, and so there's an ethical dilemma there, and, and what is specifically interesting about this is that this is um, like one possible solution to this is to move from a static experiment design to an adaptive experiment design. Um, and so really adaptive trials have grown in popularity over the past couple of decades and they provide one possible solution to that dilemma. Um, and what that solution looks like is to, is to consider the partial results when deciding whether to continue. Um, this actually has a, a, a really per like perfect analog in, uh, in decision making the multi-armed bandit problem provides a formalization of the dilemma and it describes the, uh, in, ab in abstract form the problem that's faced by any decision maker who aims to maximize reward, which in this setting is um, uh, aims to do the best for the patient, that is to, to give the patient the best possible treatment, um, but where the, the options are unknown, that is to say what, what the effect of the treatment or the control is, is unknown. And so on each trial, the decision maker selects an arm. That is here in, the, in, the, in a medical context, they select whether to assign the patient to the treatment or control. 
Um, and uh, the decision maker has to figure out what to do to balance the benefit of exploiting options known to be to provide good rewards, that is to say, to um, exploit the fact that you've, the, the partial knowledge that you've gained from the clinical trial uh, with the cost of failing to explore the other options, which is the cost of not continuing the trial and learning more about what the real uh, benefit or harm is of the different um, interventions. Okay. And so the point of bringing this up, this is not in the context really of something that you would think of as behavioral or social science, it's, it's more in medicine, but it is a very tight example where there is a kind of experiment that's being run, it's a clinical trial, and it has exactly the same form as, uh, a, a, as, 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 um, as a decision problem that uh, people have figured out algorithms um, that provide good solutions to. And so what I want to do is just have a quick breakout discussion where, uh, maybe talk to the people in your rows or the person sitting next to you and think of an algorithm existing or new that one could actually use when running a clinical trial to adaptively decide whether to assign people to the experimental condition or the control condition um, and maybe don't read the next paragraph because there's no way to hide things in a Jupyter notebook at, or at least not that I know of um, and so uh, just just discuss it and if you did already peek and read try to come up with a new one I'll just give you like a, a couple minutes on this. Okay, has anybody thought of a fun algorithm that they'd like to share? so they can hear you. Wednesday lose shift. Okay, that's an interesting one. So uh, what that means is uh, on every trial, uh, you have, you have a, a, a participant come in, you're deciding whether to give them the treatment or not. Uh, let's, we'll say we start randomly, so we just flip a coin and say we're gonna give them the treatment. Uh, we give them the treatment and now we observe the outcome. So they had some disorder and uh, we find that it was, it was not, there was no significant benefit to them of giving them this treatment. Uh, so it's win, stay, lose, shift. We consider that one a loss and so we shift, which is we go to the other option. So now we get a new person who comes in and uh, we're deciding whether to give them the treatment or the control. Uh, and uh, we decide now because we shifted, we're gonna, we're gonna give them the control. And now uh, we give them the control and um, uh, nothing happens. <laughs> and so we, uh, we, we shift back. And what's, uh, it's a little weird to do this in the context of a treatment and control. It's more often done in the context of two things that are have expected to have uh, positive value, but you don't know which one's gonna have, have uh, higher value. Um, so a better way to compare would be instead of uh, saying that it, it, like, you would you'd have some quantitative measure of how much, it, how much uh, each of two different possible treatments helps versus two conditions. Um, but the, the, core, the core idea of the algorithm is uh, if it works, stay with it. If it doesn't, shift to, to another option. And this is actually something that does quite well under certain assumptions of uh, like what kinds of disorders people might have and how the uh, 
um, interventions might help them. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, okay, the second thing I want to I want to talk about. Um, th there are there are many algorithms. This is an entire field of computer science, um, which is uh, thinking about different kinds of constraints and how they determine what is the uh, optimal algorithm to use to maximize expected reward, which in this case is uh, doing the best for the patients um, in the in the long run, beyond just the particular trial, but um, over the course of all the patients you might ever see. Um, Thompson sampling is another one. What that does is it addresses the exploration exploitation dilemma by probability matching to the posterior, po posterior probability that an arm provides the highest reward. And so what that means is that when it's uncertain, it's uh, noisier, but as it learns more and more, it, it, uh, it starts to uh, use the uh, options that, that have tended to produce uh, better rewards and eventually just deterministically uh, selects the one that pr pr produces the higher reward. Okay, so I started with medicine because it is one of the oldest examples of what I think of as algorithmic uh, experimentation, but it's definitely not the one that has had the biggest impact on all of your lives. In fact, you all are almost certainly part of A-B testing uh, and a, a kind of non-clinical variant of a clinical trial uh, every day. There have been some attempts to estimate how many experiments we are unwitt unwittingly participating in just by navigating the, the internet on a, on a given day. And the answer is something like, uh, like, like has the form of Hofstadter's law where it's surprisingly high even if you adjust for knowing that it's surprisingly high. Um, pretty much every big website does this all the time. Um, every political campaign does this all the time. If, if you get an email from a politician saying, hey, can you, will you, are you, will, would you like to donate to our campaign? That button is gonna have a color and rep, uh, be assured that um, they have uh, tested multiple variants of it, and it's very likely actually that they are adaptively adjusting the color of those buttons as they learn from, from new data, trying to, in that case, maximize uh, some objective function, which there is probably uh, either click rate or actual donations to, to their campaign. Um, and this happens, it happens really everywhere. Uh, you may have noticed sometimes that, you're, that the websites you visit seem to change, but then they go back to, to it being a different way. You might see Google has slightly different behavior one day than the next and wonder, whoa, what happened? Is that, and yeah, it, this is, like you are part of a huge set of, of experiments that are just happening all the time uh, on, on the internet. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, one of the things that I think is most interesting about it is, uh, is to think about like what are some examples of A-B testing in the wild and uh, specifically, is A-B testing of user experience design, like changing the color of buttons or changing the actual structure of, of interactions, is it human subjects research and what ethical concerns might actually arise in doing that kind of experimentation? Uh, but I think that's a particularly important question because this is one where the participants very often don't know that they are part of an experiment, right? Like I, I am voluntarily, uh, you know, going on Twitter and using it as a product that I'm sure I signed away every right I might have just in signing up for it. Um, but, but, I, but, you know, I, I did not necessarily consent to participate in human subjects research. And so it's, it's interesting to think about to what extent is user experience design um, human subjects research. So let's do another quick breakout into groups um, and just think about it. Like, do you know of any examples where you have been the participant of user experience um, uh, A-B testing where they might be using some algorithm to adaptively adjust them to better fit you, um, and also like wh where do you fall on, on the on the spectrum of thinking that oh yeah that's that's a that's a totally fine thing I'm a I'm a I'm a customer using a product um, I signed a, I, I I signed up for it I they can do whatever they want to the other side of things where this is human subjects research they should be perhaps passing this through an IRB and thinking very carefully about how their interventions affect uh, the people that they uh, serve. Go for it.
interested in that. Um, if you are interested in reading more about uh, clinical trials, research ethics, A-B testing, algorithms for adaptive trials, um, a good place on the research, research ethics side is the, the classic, it's the Belmont Report. It's a pretty interesting document. Uh, the second here is um, a uh, machine learning paper on uh, creating and uh, evaluating algorithms for adaptive trials. Um, and the third is really just um, I think this might be a chapter of a book on describing the, the abstract form of a problem as a multi-arm bandit. Okay, so that's A-B testing and clinical trials, and it's one example of uh, experiments as algorithms. The next thing I want to talk to you about is, uh, is, another, is another kind of experiment that's been around for a really long time. Um, clinical trials have been around for a long time, and so has the transmission chain. This actually goes back to the very early days of psychology. Uh, so Frederick Bartlett's 1932 book, Remembering, documents early experiments that explore how using and transmitting a memory can affect the, the memory's contents. Um, Bartlett was particularly interested in understanding how culture shapes memory. Um, inspired by uh, Philippe 1897, this is, this is really just at the very, very beginnings of people starting to do experimental psychology. Um, Bartlett performed a series of experiments that are a lot like the children's game of telephone, where he asks people to repeatedly recall a memory, or, to, or, or in this case, to pass it down a chain of people from one to the next. Um, and what Bartlett showed is that the process of reproduction alters the memories over time, causing them to take on features from an individual's culture. Um, and more generally, the methods that he developed expose cumulative effects of forces that reshape and degrade memories, um, and also how they impact the contents of what we remember. So here's one example. This is an actual stimulus that, he, uh, like a story that he used in, in uh, the, the book was written in 1932, but the experiments were actually done over the course of about 20 years, um, starting in about uh, 1910. And so this is uh, one of the stories that he showed uh, participants. What he would do is, um, this wasn't in the context of a lab really, it was more that he would, um, he would just, it was more of a one-on-one, -on -one. he would show people a story um, they'd sit down, they, they'd read through it as carefully, they, they'd have uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes to just carefully look it over. He would then take it away, there was some period in between, and he'd then give them a, a pen and paper and say, do your best to recall the story verbatim. Uh, they would write it down to the best of their ability, and then he would use what was written on that paper as the stimulus that's, that's used for the next participant who he would talk to. And so why I bring this up is this is one of the earliest examples of an adaptive design. And it's, an, it's one of the earliest examples I know of something that, um, that in a modern context would really benefit from crowdsourcing and automation, where this is a, an example where you are adaptively adjusting the entire experiment. You're adaptively adjusting the, the, the stimulus that you showed to somebody in a way that is entirely contingent on what uh, previous participants did. If you didn't know what previous participants did, there would be no way to do the second trial of a transmission chain. Um, okay, and so, um, is anybody like an actor who wants to read this? I don't, I, don't have, I don't have a great British accent, and I also don't know anything about cricket, so I'm just kind of going blind here. Um, but if anybody, anybody, has anybody played cricket and wants to, wants to do this? Otherwise, I'll just read it. Um, Okay, so here, here, here's the original story, and I'm going to read this out loud because I want you to. Um, we're just gonna. I'm just gonna scroll away from it for a second, so you just get a visceral sense of like, like where memory, how quickly much like memories are gonna fade. 
Um, okay. The match between Middlesex and Kent was continued at Lord's yesterday before another large crowd. The revival of interest in uh, county cricket is undoubtedly the leading feature of this summer's sport. It is most encouraging to old lovers of the game and to, those who, and to those who, like the writer, believe that cricket is the greatest of the national games and is something of an index of the national greatness. Mr. Bickmore and Hardinge continued the Kent innings to the bowling of Durston from the pavilion end and Hearn. They both began quietly, Mr. Bickmore alone showing lack of restraint in feeling at some of Durston's short ones on the off. He will become a great batsman if he can overcome the desire to score off good balls before he is set. The wicket was by no means perfect after the rain the day before, and after adding 20 runs in as many minutes, Mr. Bickmore was stumped in having a go at, at Hearn. Seymour soon left, well taken low down in the slips with a left hand by Mr. Kidd, a beautiful catch. Woolley came in and seemed set at once. He played every ball with, ease, with equal ease and confidence and seemed able to score off any ball. Hardinge, who had been batting really well, was caught at cover in attempting a second four off Lee, who had replaced Durston, three for 49. Mr. Hedges then joined Woolley in some of the most beautiful batting seen at Lords this year followed. There was hardly a rash and stroke, and yet the ball traveled to the boundary in all directions with almost monotonous regularity. Owing to the curtailed play on Saturday, Colonel Trofton was probably right in declaring at the T interval with the score at 360 for three. Woolley's 182 not out was one of the greatest innings he had ever played. Though the pitch was never easy and the bowling never really loose, he batted without fault or apparent doubt. Mr. Hedges also played a beautiful innings, though not so faultless. Middlesex had a bad time after tea before rain again stopped the play, losing four good wickets for 75. During the day, 18,500 people paid for admission. I just realized that if like somebody walks by now, they're going to think this is a reading of some kind. Um, um, okay, so the point of reading that, and I'm just going to talk a little bit to kind of distract you and so that you're not rehearsing it or anything like that. The point of, of doing this is I'm going to ask for a volunteer in a second to attempt to recall the entire story uh, of verbatim. And uh, it's, it's, you'll, you'll find it to be remarkably hard because it's a long story. And importantly, um, for many of you, this story made just about no sense. Um, I'm uh, American and I grew up with baseball and a bunch of the words sounded familiar but they were all doing the wrong things and I was confused. Um, it was actually just hard to say it out loud because I didn't know what words to expect next. Um, okay, can I get a volunteer to just try to do the whole thing verbatim? Uh, you have it in front of you, I know, but like, you'd have to just not look at it. It's a, I'm going to show you what a few actual participants did and they were they didn't get more than a sentence or two, so if you can remember even the topic of it, you're going to do just about as well as they do, so don't feel embarrassed. Volunteer? Um, so there was a cricket game between two cities. Okay. Um, and it was also the first time that I saw cricket Okay, great. No, no, no. So, I mean, no, no, no. two place names, that's, that's, that's pretty solid. What I'm going to show you is somebody who, like, um, I'll show you a couple of participants, and I'll show you the next person in the chain, what they, what they got. So here's, here's the first participant's reproduction. This is somebody who's, like, sitting there for about 15 minutes, and, like, there isn't as much social pressure to just give up because it's a little weird that everybody's listening. Great. So they just gave it their best bet. There was a cricket match yesterday, and some British people had fond memories of how great the sport, <laughs> sport is. Uh, Mr. Bickmore went bowling and, and, and the Hearn is one of the greatest batters of all time. The ball traveled far and the score was 360 wickets or something. <laughs> then they all had tea and it rained because England suddenly <laughs> lost a wicket. Thousands of, pe thousands of people went to go see the game. Okay, so that was, that was like a lot of content. Like, you can actually start to see like this problem. This person is not like familiar with cricket because I, I'm not very familiar either, but it sounds like they're using some of the words in a different way than the original did. Okay, uh, the second. There was a cricket game yesterday and some British people remember the sport fondly. Bickmore and Hearn are really great batters. Everyone drank tea and it rained because they were in England. <laughs> Thousands of people went to the game, but somebody lost their ticket. <laughs> the third. There was a cricket match yesterday. The British are fond of the sport. Uh, Bickmore and Hearn were the greatest batters. It rained and they served tea to the thousands of people who went to the game, except somebody lost their ticket, uh, Crowny Hayes. And the fourth. There was a cricket match yesterday. The British are fond of the sport. Blackmore and Hearn are the greatest batters in the history of the sport. It rained during the game, so they served tea to everyone except the people who lost their tickets. 
Okay, so you, like, you start to see that it's, 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 it's having all the things that are characteristic of experiments of this kind. The, um, it's getting, it, the text is getting uh, shorter, it's losing detail, and uh, this is done on mechanical Turk, and so I know that the people weren't British. It's, it's, it's coming to take on aspects of the participant's culture, not the, um, the target culture, which here is, um, I, I, think it, I think it takes place in England. That's where Bartlett was, was from, and uh, that's where a bunch of the stories are from, or in, in newspaper things. Okay, so one of the benefits of going last is that you've already learned a whole set of tools and I can just say, okay, go use those tools and apply them in whatever way you can. And so um, this is just a free form exercise, which is there are five pieces of text. They are five chains in a transmission. The original is the source material from the 1932 book. Um, let's see, I, I, I don't know how this will go, but let's just give it a try. Use one of the tools that you've learned over the past three days to do some kind of analysis. The simplest thing you could do would be just put those all in some kind of data structure um, whatever you want, maybe uh, a list, a dictionary, um, you can think about what's appropriate for this kind of data, which is uh, a chain, um, and then do some kind of uh, analysis on it. The minimal analysis would be how about how, how, how many words there are or something like that. Do some kind of very basic parsing. Um, or you can use some of the quite interesting tools you've, you've learned over the past uh, couple of days to do some kind of deeper analysis. Um, I'm going to give you several minutes to do this. Um, and uh, I will then ask for a volunteer if somebody has come up with something cool that they're interested in sharing. Otherwise, um, I'll just give you a couple of the analyses that Bartlett did when he looked at uh, text of this kind.
Anybody have anything preliminary they want to share? Or don't want to share but are willing to? Like one thing you could share would be what data structure you put it in. All right, here's a second call for if anybody wants to share. So it's like it's, it's taking data that was in a quite unstructured format. It was just cells in a, in a, in a Jupyter notebook and putting it into something that um, is a pretty standard tool, something that uh, could, be, could be shared, um, could be converted into other uh, formats like, a, like CSV files or whatever it is you want. That's great, and that, that's exactly the kind of thing that modern tooling uh, allows you to do in a way uh, that's much more efficient than what, what Bartlett would have done. Uh, a lot of his analyses were looking at specific words or phrases and tracking their, uh, their changes over the course of, uh, of, of, of steps, in the ch steps along the chain. Okay, so we'll, 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 just, we'll, we'll stop uh, with this exercise for now. Um, if you feel inspired and want to pick it back up later, like these, these data sets are actually are, are, are out there. He, he, uh, the, the, the book actually contains all of the data within it. Um, and you can actually go and, and get a, he ran these chains forward for 20 participants and has the, the, uh, the, the plain text of those documents in it. And I think it's an interesting case where you can, you can look at how um, somebody would have uh, approached the, the same data set in uh, 1932 using the post-textual analysis and perhaps apply uh, uh, natural language processing tools or, or, or other kinds of uh, automated textual analysis tools to uh, learn something about the effects of, uh, of uh, forgetting on the content of uh, stories. Okay, so that's, um, that is often called serial reproduction. Um, the, the title is a transmission chain because that's the abstract form of the, the process, right? It's, there's some source, it's the actual story itself, there's a participant, there's some transmission from, there's some, there's some like observation of the source material and some attempt to recreate it. Um, that recreation is then used as the source material for the next participant who then attempts to recreate it. Um, and, and, and when I say recreate, it's literally reproduce it verbatim. And so because it's uh, serial in a chain and because they are attempting to reproduce the, the content verbatim, it's called serial reproduction. There's a quite related technique called iterated learning which is, has exactly the same structure where there is some source material, uh, a participant observes it in some way and then produces something which is then used as the source material for the next participant. 
Um, but in iterated learning, they are not, give, they are not necessarily given the, the entirety of the contents and the key of what is, what is causing them to be unable to reproduce the ground truth exactly is that they don't have access to everything and they must infer what was actually there. Um, so like a really a small manipulation that you can do to turn the serial reproduction task into an iterated learning task is one in which you would maybe strike out every other sentence and ask somebody to infer something about the structure of the story. Um, like, uh, um, and uh, okay, so that, that's, that's, that's iterated learning. What I want to show you is a much more uh, recent example of, of, uh, of uh, iterated learning in the context of functions that really brings out the context in which this uh, is implementing an algorithm. Uh, so I'm going to flip over to um, a set of slides that just, um, the kind of thing that's just much more, ooh, where'd it go? Give me one moment to find the slides, and then it should be right here. Okay. Um, so modern reincarnations of iterated learning and of, uh, of these transmission chains use stimuli that are much easier to control and measure than freeform prose. Uh, Kalish and colleagues, uh, one of whom is uh, Tom Griffith sitting in the back, um, studied this in the context of transmitting functions, <coughs> the relationship between one thing and another. Um, in the task, participants are given two bars like this. There's uh, a horizontal bar and there's going to be a vertical bar. And their goal is to predict the relationship between the length of the horizontal bar and the height of the vertical bar. The vertical bar will be, will be red. Um, so they're given data in the form of pairs of, they, 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 they see a horizontal bar and now they're asked to guess how big the, the vertical bar is. And really all they know is that there is some relationship between the two, uh, but they have no idea what that relationship is. It could be could be anything. So why don't you all take a guess? How big is the red bar going to be? Okay, I've got one. This, which uh, can you can you say that so I know where the top part could be? Yeah. Okay. So so uh, Monica with her hands is doing something where it's where her guess is that it's about the same size. Okay. So you get the data. It comes back. Yep. That's ex that's exactly right. The red bar. When the blue bar is that long, the red bar is this tall. Okay. So uh, now we do. Uh, we, then we get feedback and we find out, no, that was wrong. In fact, when the blue bar is that big, that's how big the red bar ought to have been. Um, okay, so now we've, gotten, we've taken one guess and we've gotten feedback, which is uh, we thought it was gonna be exactly the same size and we get one, one trial of feedback, which is no, in fact, when the, when the blue bar is that long, the red bar ought to have been that high. And what you should notice is that already you've, you've, you've narrowed down things quite a bit. I bet when I now show you this, um, and now you take a guess. What, what's your guess now? Okay, right. So I show it to you, and great, you 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 you, you get you get it right on the first on the first uh, or in, right. Now now you're pretty well calibrated. Okay. What's quite interesting about this is this uh, this task of function learning is something that cognitive psychologists have studied in detail, and it turns out that some functions are much easier to learn than others. Uh, a the, the the line y equals x is the easiest to learn. Harder than that is y equals negative x. Harder still is uh, curvilinear forms. And the hardest thing to learn is just a random mapping of x and y values. Like what, knowing, knowing, knowing what one pair is tells you nothing about what the other pair is except that it has a different value. Um, okay, so what you can do now is uh, insert this task into an iterated learning, uh, into an iterated learning um, chain, into a transmission chain. So what you do is you start by, the, the first participant comes in and they learn from the ground truth. So here what I'm going to show you is four different chains, A, B, C, and D. This is the ground truth of what the function was, relating the, on the horizontal axis, the, the horizontal bar to, to the vertical bar. So A was positive linear, uh, B negative linear, C is this kind of sinusoidal curve, and D is actually a random mapping of X and Y values. The first participant who comes into the lab, they observe some data in the form of pairs of X and Y values with, with feedback and then they uh, are tested, and they're tested on pairs that they didn't see. So they just get a horizontal bar and they have to guess how big the, the vertical bar is. 
and here's the data that they produce. And what you should see is that um, it's pretty close to the original. There's some, there's some uh, for, for A, it's pretty much dead on. For B, it's starting, it's a little bit weird. Uh, C, you can note that there are very specific uh, changes that are starting to occur. D, it's a little hard to interpret just from, just from one, but you can start to see that it, it looks different in form than, it, than, the, than the original. Right, here's the second participant. And this second participant, instead of learning from the ground truth, they learn from the first participant. Here's the third participant who learned from the second. Here's the fourth who learned from the third. Here's the fifth who learned from the fourth. The sixth who learned from the fifth. The seventh who learned from the sixth. The eighth who learned from the seventh. And the ninth who learned from the eighth. And so what you should see is that no matter what the original functional form is, um, the chain reverts to those that were easiest to learn. Um, and what's quite interesting here is that you can actually prove that if the individual learners are Bayesian, this system of, of transmitting information through uh, iterated learning um, on a transmission chain uh, produces a Markov chain that visits uh, functions with proportion to their probability under the prior. So you assume a shared prior across all the learners, um, which is to say you are actually in running a transmission chain like this forward you are implementing a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm to sample from a probability distribution. And that probability distribution is something that's in the participant's mind. It is their prior over different functional forms, different relationships between how these two particular things, height and width, uh, could relate. Um, and so this is a, I think this is a pretty clean example of um, taking a, a quite old experiment design, something that's been around since the earliest days of psychology, and by formalizing it and, 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 and thinking about the ways in which it relates to, uh, to algorithms, you can actually unite these things so that the, an experiment design is also an algorithm for sampling from uh, cognitive representations. Okay, so that is the transmission chain in the form of iterated learning. If this is something you're interested in, um, the earliest thing you could read would be uh, Frederick Bartlett's 1932 book, Remembering. It's pretty interesting. It contains, I think you'll be surprised um, at just how much of, like how many ideas these writers had um, that, that really like set the stage for what research on, on, uh, on memory would, would be. Um, and then the, the, the paper with the, the data that I just showed you was from, Kalish Griffiths and uh, Lewandowski, 2007, uh, on iterated learning in psychonomic bulletin and review. Okay, so this is a second kind of experiment that uh, is equivalent to a particular algorithm. Okay, the next example we're gonna look at is called interactive ev evolutionary computation. So preferences can be elicited experimentally by asking a participant to choose which thing they prefer. Um, so for example, in psychology and behavioral economics, it's really common to have uh, a study of temporal discounting where you give a person a choice between either a small sum that they get right now or a larger sum that they would only get later. And often what you'll do is um, a two alternative forced choice design where you say which of these two things uh, would, you, would you like and you would, you would do that over all possible pairs of competing forms and use that to figure out uh, which things people prefer. The issue though is that figuring out what people prefer by taking, by doing pairwise trials of all the possible combinations scales really, really poorly when there are many options to choose from. Um, when it's just a small reward now or a larger reward later, it's okay, you can do the, the, you can do the two by two with no problem. Um, but let's scale up just a little bit to thinking about uh, people's preferences for, for vanity phone numbers. A vanity phone number is a, is a sequence of digits that's more memorable than just a random string. Uh, so for example, one, two, oh, two, four, five, six, one, 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 um, which uh, that's the phone number for the White House, though it's not a direct line to Trump. Um, uh, and so an algorithm that finds uh, preferred vanity numbers by taking input of pairwise preference judgments um, is just entirely intractable. Uh, there are lots of other possibilities though, and uh, one of them is uh, interactive evolutionary computation, which can solve problems like this uh, like, like finding good uh, vanity phone numbers by actually inserting humans into various parts of an evolutionary process. 
Uh, so in one particular kind of interactive evolutionary computation called an interactive genetic algorithm, a human participant acts as the selection mechanism um, using their aesthetic judgment to select which forms will replicate to uh, produce the next generation. And in many cases, these algorithms quickly converge on the preferred forms. Uh, so here we have, a, we have a triplet, and this is, this is the theme that you're going to see connects everything that I'm, that I'm going to be talking about. It, it, it pairs three components. Um, the interactive, interactive evolutionary computation pairs three components. Uh, the first one is an algorithm. In this case, it's a genetic algorithm, uh, some implementation of an evolutionary process. The second component is a design space. Instead of just having one particular thing that you're going to test, one particular experimental manipulation or one particular stimulus, you have a design space of possible stimuli that describe all the different forms that the, that the thing you're going to judge uh, could take. Or in the case of manipulations, it's the design space of all the different parameters that you can control in a system um, uh, that, that, that are controllable and available to you. And the third part, and this is the key, is an automator, which is a computer program or a web application that's actually going to automate the human in the loop computa computation um, navigating the design space using the algorithm. And so uh, I'd like to show you a, 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 a nice example of this. Um, it's not one uh, uh, on Dallinger, it's one that's on a, an existing web application. It's called endlessforms.com. And so why don't you go to this website, I'll go there in a second, um, endlessforms.com. And what you'll see is this is an implementation of interactive evolutionary computation. It's an interactive genetic algorithm. And what they've, what they've done is they've designed, they've created a design space of 3D objects, which they then render and have spin around on its uh, like vertical axis to just show you what the, what the object looks like from all different angles. Um, and what you'll get to do is to evolve them, uh, evolve the population of them. And so in the first exercise, what I'd like you to do is to, uh, I'm going to tell you what, your object, what the objective function is for this, 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 this search. Um, and the one is going to be, pick the form that you find to be most aesthetically pleasing. Um, so the way you'll do that is you'll choose as many of them that you find to be aesthetically pleasing. You know, you could, you could choose just one if you only like one of them, or you could choose four of them or, or, or many of them. Uh, so I'm going like, to click that one because I like that one. I, I like how smooth this one is, and I like, how, uh, I like the shape of that one. I like the shape of that one. And then you'll click Evolve. And what it's going to do behind the scenes is it's going to take those objects that you select, and they are going to be the seeds of the next generation. I haven't really considered that maybe we could totally overload their surface. I don't know if this is a, um, has this, did it work for anybody? Um, did it not work for anybody? We're doing an accidental denial of service attack. attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll happen eventually. So what it's doing is um, you are the fitness function, which is to say you're assigning like a binary fitness value to each of them. There's some that you're assigning zero, some that you're assigning one. And it's now using, um, it's going to each of those. Those are the ones that make it to the next generation. They are uh, replicated and mutated. Um, according to whatever their internal model is of, uh, of, of the shapes and whatever the particular evolutionary processes that they're using. Um, and those seed the next generation, which they then show you. And you can now uh, repeat this. And on a day when we don't have as many as like 75 people slamming it all at once, this is, this, I think this is probably from like 1990s, and I don't know if it's ever been touched since then, um, you'll see that you can, you can evolve forms and they come to take exactly the, the shape that you're, you're you're imagining, or the ones that, like, uh, they, they narrow in on something that you'll find to be pleasing. Um, okay, so because, uh, is, any, is there anybody for whom it is just working perfectly smoothly? Because <laughs> then I'll have you just do it. Okay, great, okay, so at least, at least we know what the issue is. Okay, so I'm not gonna have you do the second exercise because you're just gonna see the same thing, um, but the second exercise, we'll, we'll, we'll do a, a variant of it, which is, um, the, the second one was going to be, okay, so I, I handed you the fitness function for the first one. I, I said what the objective function was, which is it should be aesthetics. Um, but this time, um, I want you to, like, and we won't actually do it because uh, server overload, but um, can you think of an objective function that relies on some human cognitive capacity that couldn't easily be replicated by a machine? Aesthetic judgments are probably a good example of that, but try to think of, of another. Um, and so, uh, I suggested calling your shots by writing, the, writing down the objective function you'll use. Um, why don't you actually still do that? Call your shots, but you'll just take the shot 
couple hours or something. Because I'm sure somebody came up or will come up with an interesting one, I'm just going to wait until somebody's willing to share. Um, but I'll just give you a little bit long. Okay, does anybody have an interesting uh, objective function that they might want to use that um, touches upon something that seems quite human? You could you know, select something that looks particularly cozy. Okay, cozy, yeah. That's... Uh, if you wanted to eat a bowl of noodles, would you use it as some sort of piece? I just think noodles. That's very good. So that, that's touching upon the fact that uh, people are quite good at recognizing uh, 3D form from, from from, from, the, from the figures and also um, know something about the context of like what a noodle is like and, and what its texture is like and, and what kind of vessel it would or would not uh, go well on, which probably is like I don't know, some, some surface properties of noodleage and like I'm, I'm even like, yeah, okay, that's good. That's, that seems, yeah. um, maybe we could train an algorithm to do it, but it's, it's probably on the edge. One more? Okay, I, I like the cozy thing. I was thinking of like, what would it be like to jump into a um, pen, like a ball pen full of objects of that shape? Um, how would that, like, what, what, would, what would that do? Um, and, you know, depending on what shape it is, that could either go ter terribly wrong or it could be fun. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you want some further reading, the classic in this entire field is uh, Interactive Evolutionary Computation by H. Takagi, uh, 2001. And it talks about every example imaginable of this, of this, of this uh, triplet of inserting people into taking an algorithm. In this case, it's one of many different kinds of uh, evolutionary processes and evolutionary algorithms. Um, combining it with uh, a design space of forms. It could be aesthetic forms. It could be objects that you want to design. It could be uh, many different kinds of things and combining it with some actual system that automates the process of running the algorithm and getting feedback from humans. Uh, this is a pretty classic example of human in a loop computation. Okay, and number four is Markov chain Monte Carlo with people. So a central goal of cognitive psychology is to elucidate the mental representations that underlie people's perceptions, inferences, decisions uh, about the world. And uh, psychologists have lots of methods for studying these mental representations, um, often by asking people to make judgments about fixed sets of stimuli that are chosen at the outset of the experiment. Uh, so for example, a really classic method is multidimensional scaling. Um, and that often begins with a matrix of pairwise dissimilarity judgments between the items in a set. So for example, relative distances between major cities in the US. And it then uses that, that pairwise dissimilarity matrix to, uh, to find a low dimensional space that preserves the similarity structure, reducing the dimensionality to, to, to something that's, that's lower but still preserves the similarity structure. Uh, so for example, a 2D map. So if you just go to that link, this is just a pretty nice example of doing that for exactly this case of um, what you'll see, I'll zoom in here. Um, so this is multidimensional scaling and uh, we're given a set of distances, dissimilarities between objects. Um, and then we want to know whether we can recover some actual underlying space that, that, they, that these things live in. Um, so here, these are cities in the United States. And so we have the sense that like, we kind of know how the distances relate and what, uh, what like, space the, the data naturally lives in, right? It's like a, it's on the surface of a sphere. Um, we know that like the, you know, cities might vary a little bit in, in elevation, but like that's about the most. And so we, and you have a very clear sense of what, what the structure of that is. Um, so there is a pairwise dissimilarity matrix. 
Um, and you can just use that to, um, to form, perform multi-dimensional scaling. You'll scroll down and you'll see uh, this figure. Um, and this figure, uh, if you rotate it in your head, and uh, what else do you have to do? You, uh, uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll get back a map of the United States. I guess you could also just look upside down and turn the labels upside down too. Um, right, so it's, it recovers the, the underlying structure there. Uh, the point is that you can do this not just for uh, cities where the distances between cities are not uh, like the way they're written here is, uh, is not a psychological quantity, it's a number of miles between the cities. But you can make a very small modification to this that actually makes it a psychological experiment um, like uh, a human estimation of distance, right? That would that would be that that's not necessarily correct, and you might get quite uh, different kinds of uh, kinds of ratings. Uh, the point here, though, the reason for bringing this up is not because not for the particular method itself, but it's that um, here you choose this 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 like you have a set of stimuli. It's, it's uh, nine cities by nine cities, and so if you're going to have a participant come in and do a study where they're going to judge the where you want to like get uh, ratings of psychological distance, you just you would, you'd pick each pair and you'd have them rate each pair one by one. It's a fixed set of stimuli and it just goes through them perhaps at random. Um, okay, uh, and so though these methods are really quite successful, they're inefficient because they don't use the information that you learned during an experiment to inform the design of the experiment. Um, so a more efficient technique to reveal human uh, mental representations is based on uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo which is a class of algorithms from statistical physics that samples from a probability distribution by constructing a Markov chain that converges on the distribution of interest. Uh, and just as a reminder, a Markov chain is a stochastic process that is defined by a transition matrix that tells you the probability of going from one state uh, to any other. Um, and there's lots of variants of Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo, and they differ in, uh, in how each new state of the chain is proposed and then perhaps either accepted or rejected. The key, though, is that the, um, there is an equivalence to be noted, and that equivalence is between a particular, uh, a particular acceptance function that's used in MCMC algorithms and a particular like, mental acceptance function, which is a choice rule uh, proposed by, uh, by uh, Duncan Luce um, called the, the Luce cho choice axiom, and it's a, it's a classic decision rule um, in psychology. And uh, Sanborn et al. Uh, designed an experiment that pairs these two things, noting their equivalency to actually design a human-in-a-loop uh, MCMC uh, algorithm, where instead of having, uh, a, uh, uh, in, instead of having uh, an acceptance function that is uh, like programmatic, the acceptance function is one that is psychological. Um, so specifically, on each iteration of the algorithm, the participant is asked which of two stimuli belong to the category under question. And the idea is that if uh, participants are choosing with the objects with probability propor proportional to the probability that those objects are uh, like fall under the category under question, um, then the human is implementing the, the Barker acceptance function. And what's really quite interesting about that is in, in, a, in a way that's quite similar to how the analysis works for uh, the, what happens as you run a transmission chain forward, uh, you can also prove that if you run this MCMC uh, sampler forward, what you get are samples from the human's prior. Um, in this case, it's their priors over uh, object categories. Um, okay, and so the particular, the particular um, application here, um, or <laughs> one particular validation of it, this isn't the ultimate application, this is just like a, a, a nice simple way to validate it, um, is uh, through, for example, stick figure animals. And so the, it, what, what you do is you first, des first you define a design space of the objects. Here it is stick figure animals. They're parameterized by like the, the, um, the leg length, the neck angle, the neck length, the, the head length, the tail length, the body length. Um, there's, 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 and each of these could, can, vary, can vary independently. Um, you start with just uh, randomly sampling a quadruped, um, not from any particular category. Um, to, uh, two of them, and you ask the human participant which one of them is the uh, giraffe, horse, cat, or dog. Um, they select one of the two. You then take the one that they select. They are acting as this algorithm's acceptance function. You take the one that they select. Um, that one makes it on to the next generation of uh, the, next, the next trial. 
um, and uh, it is then perturbed, and you get a, 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 new, a new selection. Um, and you uh, iterate this process forward, and what you end up with is um, an experiment that is adaptively designing the stimuli in such a way that it samples from the, from the category under question. Um, and so uh, the rows here are categories, the columns are participants, and the object that you're seeing is um, the average across the, the, the samples um, that, that the human uh, produced. Um, and so what you see is the giraffes look like giraffes, the horses look like horses, the cats look like cats, the dogs look like dogs. Um, and importantly, it, this did not require creating pairwise judgments across huge numbers of different kinds of stimuli. It provided a more efficient means of traversing uh, that space. And again, specifically by noting an equivalence between a particular kind of uh, experiment, which is uh, just like a sequential decision problem between two different, two different choices and, and, and making a category uh, membership judgment, um, and uh, an MCMC algorithm. Okay, um, if you want further reading, here is the uh, original, it's called Uncovering Mental Representations with Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Um, and there are several variants of this that look at different kinds of uh, distributions and different kinds of information. Um, and the overall take home is that it's another example of uh, experiment design as algorithm design. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick break now. This concludes section zero on experiments as algorithms. Next, we're gonna talk about Dallinger, which is um, a laboratory automation system that allows you, that um, builds off of SciTurk to uh, essentially automate as much of the research pipeline in the behavioral and social sciences. And we'll come back in like five minutes or so. That's not juicy enough. You can do both. What? No. Those are well known. I don't know. No, I'm not going to want anything. 
Oh wait, I'm like, my mic. <laughs> How many times can I do that? I'm making noise, right? You've heard the things about like people go to the bathroom and leaving the mic on, like, TV shows and stuff. Or just like go to the bathroom. Yeah.
Okay, so we're back. What I'd like to start with is a little bit of the origin story of Dallinger. Dallinger is a total laboratory automation system for the behavioral and social sciences that grew out of um, a desire to run experiments of the form that I, that I just showed you. To run experiments that involve, for example, very long chains of sequential decisions across people. Or to run experiments that involve um, recruiting batches of people to participate in some kind of evolutionary algorithm, to send them away, and then to recruit a new batch of participants who learn from or interact with whatever the output was of the previous generation. Um, we saw in the morning SciTurk, and SciTurk is, is an excellent tool and, was an, and, pr and provided an excellent starting place for um, doing this kind of crowdsourced uh, experimentation. What we did was we built on top of SciTurk um, a whole set of uh, like concepts that allow you to do automated recruitment and specifically automated conditional recruitment, which is to say to recruit participants who are um, like to conditionally recruit participants and instead of just having them come back to the experiment and do exactly the same thing that the first participant did, to instead treat them differently in some way. And so Dallinger bakes into it, it has baked into it, the concept of um, arranging participants into a network structure, having information get transmitted between participants, um, to have new participants be recruited and added to an existing network, to have the, 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 to, have the, to have it be the case that on, at, on the, at the moment that a new participant joins the network, to, to have some prop underlying process determine what gets transmitted to them. Um, and all of this with the goal of running these kinds of experiments, these iterated experiments, these algorithmic experiments, at a scale that goes far beyond what, it's, what is possible to do um, by hand in the laboratory or when you have to recruit sequentially each participant. Um, yeah, question. Sorry, uh, one question. Does it also entail the possibility to get the same participant to do something new or only new participants? Very recently, we have added the ability to re-recruit old participants for new things. Um, that was not the aim of this. In most of the experiments that we've run, uh, we every person who comes to the chain or who comes to the, the experiment has not participated in it, in it at all before. Um, but one could, in principle, have a design where, for example, let's say you wanted a you wanted to have like every other person in the chain be the like you know like instead of doing A B C D E F, you wanted A B A B A B. That's at least in principle possible. Um, because you can arrange people into whatever network you want, and you can uh, design a process that determines what happens when one person transmits information to another, essentially whose turn it is next. Um, okay. So, Dallinger built a whole set of tools on top of SciTurk that allow you to both uh, do this kind of conditional recruitment to this arranging of participants into networks, arranging the communication between them. Um, and then additionally also built quite a lot of machinery to automate the entire process. And in fact, we've taken it so far that the entire pipeline of experimentation can be abstracted into a single function call. And so we're not going to run this because uh, your system is not set up to run this, and because if you actually did run it, it would go run. If it were set up and you did go run this, it would actually go run uh, an experiment somewhere. But this is this is this is what 
uh, the end product looks like, which is there is a Python module, it's called Dallinger. It has at, it, it, you can register different kinds of experiments with it. You then import the experiment by doing experiment equals, in this case, uh, we're, we're looking at the, uh, at a transmission chain where you were literally transmitting the stories of the kind that I just showed you. Experiment equals dallinger.experiments.bartlett1932. And then in a single function call, you run the experiment. Data equals experiment.collect. Here we've given it this big ID, and I'll tell you why we're doing that in a little bit. It's not necessary. You can, you can just say dallinger data equals experiment.collect. And in that one function call is baked into it essentially all of dallinger's functionality. Let's talk about what happens when you actually execute that function call. The very first thing that happens is the system looks and says, has the data already been collected? And that's why it has this ID. What this is, is it is a UUID, a universally unique identifier. Um, you can create these in Python, for example. Many, uh, many uh, programming languages have support for them. Uh, you can create them in Python through the package called UUID. And what it is specifically is it's essentially a random hash, a random string of, uh, uh, of that particular form. And because it's random and so long, it contains enough bits that you can be pretty much guaranteed that if you generate a random one, there is an infinitesimally small or a negligibly small probability of it having ever been used for any purpose in the history of the world. That is to say that it is universally uh, unique. Why that's important is because it, mean, like, it means that what you can do is to um, use a technique called memoization, um, which what that does is it's a technique that says the first time you, you run a, uh, you execute a function with a particular input, go and actually execute the function. Do whatever it is that that function does on that input. However, the second time and every time thereafter, just just use results that you happen to have cached the first time. And so why that's important and what that means here is that if you, if you generate one of these IDs and the first time you run the experiment, you hand it to experiment.collect, it means that literally this notebook is, an, is a notebook that the first time it's run actually goes and collects the data and runs through the entire process. But the second time, it doesn't recollect it. It just hands you back the exact data, having gotten it either locally or through um, a, a cloud server, in which case it is just a document that you can use to analyze the data. And so why this is important, and we'll talk about this in the next section, is um, this is a unification of computational reproducibility, which we'll talk about more, but to a first approximation is the ability to run a program again and get bitwise identical output um, with experimental replica replicability and reproducibility, like the ability to rerun a behavioral experiment and actually get back the same results. Um, okay, so let's, so th that first step was, that first step that the experiment.collect method takes is look for the data. It's gonna look for it on your local system to see if there's any data set with that universally unique ID. Um, it's gonna look uh, on an Amazon S3 bucket that is for your particular account to see whether it's, it happens to be there, like maybe somebody else from your lab ran that experiment. Um, and then it'll look in a global bucket for every Dallinger user to see has anybody run this experiment. And depending on whether you, you have access rights to the data, it'll either hand you back the data, or if it exists, it'll hand you back the data or tell you where to get it. Um, and uh, if, but if it, if it doesn't have access to the data and that data has never been collected, it'll proceed to step two. Yeah? Where's the configuration for all that stuff? Where's the configuration for what stuff? Um, so the question is, where is all the configuration? Uh, the thing that I just showed you, um, like it's not the case, like this does not show you the installation of, of the, of the um, tool. Um, there is a slightly complicated installation process. It's not that bad, but it's just bad enough that like we can't just do it right now and, and, and be guaranteed that it's just gonna work. Um, but to use Dallinger, you, you give it uh, access keys for Amazon Web Services. And if, and in doing so, if if there's no bucket for your user, it just goes and creates a bucket. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's step one, which is really simple. It's like 
if the data is, if you've already run the experiment, don't go get the data again. The second one is spawn a web server. So with SciTurk, um, with the specific uh, in instance of, of the SciTurk experiment that we just saw, it was, it's run on your laptop. You can also run SciTurk experiments on cloud servers, um, on, on several different cloud servers. Here we've been using uh, Heroku, which is, which is a platform as a service. Um, and that's pretty much just a, a cloud server, but it actually it has baked into it lots of the things that you would want to run a fairly large scale experiment. So it has the ability to provision a database. It has um, scalable resource, ser uh, scalable server resources, so that um, you know if you're just running, a, if, you, if you're just running a small scale experiment with several people or a couple people participating at a time, you can get a, you can get server resources that are just equivalent to, to your laptop. Um, but it has the scalability such that if you wanted to, for example, run an experiment with tens or hundreds or thousands of people participating at once or over um, hitting your server quite hard, uh, you could just you know, turn up a knob and, and, and have that scalability there. Uh, Heroku and many of the other cloud platforms are used at, at scales that just go way beyond what uh, like experimental work in behavior, behavioral and social sciences tends to um, involve. The third is uh, source the participants. So you saw that um, with SciTurk, it, it has the ability to just automatically create new uh, hits on Mechanical Turk. Uh, Dowinger uses that exact capability to uh, automatically create a new hit on Mechanical Turk. Um, and I think many, many of us have aspirations to extend it beyond uh, Mechanical Turk for, for several reasons. One is just that there's, that's a limited pool. Um, uh, but also that uh, I think it's, it's one of the most interesting things to me about sourcing participants is how much of a dependence so much of like uh, psychology or cognitive psychology at least has on a service like like Mechanical Turk, where um, if they went away tomorrow, like half of the labs around here wouldn't know what to do. Um, and so uh, looking at towards other crowdsourcing platforms is, is useful both as a de-risker, but then also just that um, there are platforms out there, um, crowdsourcing platforms out there, that have really done a great job of, of exploring diversity and and getting um, you know finding sourcing participants from from all over the world. Uh, next step is obtaining informed consent. The very first thing they do when they enter the ex when they come to the experiment is there's a consent form. If they don't uh, consent to the experiment, nothing about them is ever recorded and they just go away. Um, and and importantly. Um, because our goal here is to automate everything, it means that if somebody does not consent to the experiment, we automatically recruit, recruit a replacement um, in their stead. Uh, the fifth piece is uh, arranging the participants into a network. This will depend entirely on the structure of the experiment. In a case like a transmission chain, it's quite simple, which is at first you just recruit one participant, you run them through the task, the moment they finish, you conditionally recruit a new participant who's uh, added to uh, like to the end of the uh, end of the chain, um, but you could create uh, uh, you could create experiments that have quite complex network structures. I'll just give two examples. One of them is not an, is not an experiment that we've run on Dowinger, but which is something that people run quite a bit. Which is um, studies of human cooperation are often run on uh, various network structures. So you have people play a game like a public goods game. That's a game where each person is given the option between donating some of their money to the group, in which case it's multiplied and spread among everybody else, um, or they have the option to defect, which is just to keep the money for themselves and, and, and not donate it to the group. Um, and it's called a public goods game because there's this kind of tension between um, the, best, the best an individual can do would be, as, would be if everybody else donated and they didn't. Um, but if everybody does that, then nobody donates and everybody's worse off. Um, and so people study that because it's, it's very important. It's, it's an important experimental paradigm for learning about the evolution of cooperation. And one of the most interesting uh, findings, I think, in, in that field is that network structure does a lot to determine the rate of the evolution of cooperation. And so people have done lots of experimental work over the past five, ten years where you bring participants either into a, uh, into a um, either into a uh, brick and mortar lab or into an online lab using tools like, um, like breadboard. Um, you arrange them into, into uh, a network structure of your choice. It could be like a lattice where uh, everybody's partner, just everybody um, is interacting with just people who are, who are right around them, but, but there's some connections to people out far away that they don't have access to, or like a scale-free network or uh, a chain or a cycle. There's lots of different possibilities. Um, so that's like one style. 
A second style, and this is one that we, one that we have run, which, which is to essentially do a, a sort of evolutionary computation where you insert humans into an evolutionary process, not as the fitness function, but as nodes. And so we run these, these, these large scale experiments where we arrange people into multi-generational experiments. It's kind of like a chain, but instead of running one chain at a time, we run uh, as many as 60 chains at a time and the chains cross each other so that it's not, it's not always just that A, B, C, D. You, you, you get these, these cross links uh, across, across generations. Um, and, the, and the biggest experiments we've run involve 2,400 people arranged into 60, uh, 40 generations of 60 participants, each conditionally recruited batch by batch, automated from beginning to end, such that uh, the only human intervention was starting the program and then looking at the data afterwards. Um, okay, so step five, arrange the participants into the network. Six, run them through the experiments. Uh, the, uh, like Dallinger does not, like, like SciTurk, there, there are many different kinds of experiments that you might want to run on it. You could do anything from a cognitive psychology task to putting people into a chat room and having them just communicate with each other to uh, online multiplayer games. I'll show you one in, in, in just a minute. Um, and so you run them through the experiment. Uh, seven, uh, debrief participants and pay them. Uh, one of the things that we're also automating here, we, like the goal is really automate the entire pipeline. And so one of those pieces of automation is uh, payment and uh, bonusing. So what that means is that in defining um, an experiment, you actually write a function that includes things like data quality checks or whatever mechanism you uh, want to use to provide participants with a bonus. Um, so it's very common to, um, for example, have a performance-based bonus. Like, you know, somebody's gonna do uh, 100 trials of a task where they're e on each trial they're either gonna be right or wrong, and you really just want to make sure that participants aren't randomly clicking, and so you give them an incentive where if they get at least 65% of the trials correct, um, they get a bonus, and if they get 85% of them, they get an even higher bonus. Um, and that's just like a useful tool to be able to prevent, um, just to, to protect against the vagaries of human behavior um, under, you know, like just, if people can, some people will always just randomly click. Um, okay, so you, and so you, you pay them, and then step eight is conditional recruitment of new participants. You may be running a, a flat uh, experiment where you just recruit a batch of, for example, 20 people, each of them does an individual task and you send them away, and so there's no, there's no uh, recruitment of new participants. Uh, but you may be running something like a chain, which has a very specific kind of recruitment where each time a participant finishes, a new one is, is, uh, is uh, recruited and added to the end of the chain. Eventually, depending on the structure of your experiment, there is some stopping rule, and so step nine is to stop the experiment when the, exper uh, the, when the experiment is done, it automatically backs the data up to uh, Amazon S3, and then it tears down the server. Uh, and finally, after all of that, that single function returns. Um, okay, so what this is, is, is like it returns, and what it ends up doing, and I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more later, is it, it returns the data in this format that includes the ability to, um, to uh, migrate it from one particular form to another particular form. So it's not stuck necessarily just being like a set of CSV files. It's something that you could, you could convert to a pandas data frame uh, or, or, or other kinds of uh, representations that might be useful for later analysis. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you first is me running um, the automator on my local system with me being all of the participants. So I'm just gonna show you me running through a transmission chain like the one I showed you, but I'm not gonna actually try to recall it because it's just, it's just me, I'll just go through it pretty quickly, but so that you can see that it's doing the, the automated recruitment um, in the right way. So, uh, oops, I'm gonna go, I'm just traversing into the correct directory and too far in. There's a bunch of demos, I'm gonna go to the one called Bartlett 1932, it's exactly the demo that you saw. Um, I'm going to write Dallinger debug verbose. This is the equivalent of that uh, Dallinger.collect. It's just done on the command line as opposed to in a separate script. Uh, I'm going to run that. Um, prints a little header. It saves everything to a temporary directory. It spawns a web server. It says it's launching the experiment. And then I'm gonna flip back there for a second. What you saw, like I wasn't touching it and it just opened uh, a web browser window. I'm just gonna go back for a second so you can see that like there's a new recruitment request 
Um, and it, it noticed that, and so it opened up a new browser window. I'll make this bigger so that you can see it. Um, this looks quite a lot like SciTurk because that's what it, 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 it has been under the hood. Um, it says, thanks for accepting the hit. Uh, you can begin the experiment. You begin, needs your consent. You sign the consent form. You agree. Read the instructions. You'll read a pa passage of text. Your job is to remember the passage as well as you can because you'll be asked some questions about it afterwards. You then begin. It shows you a, a, some text. This happens to be a different story, but it's one of, still one of the originals. Uh, you read it. You could set a timer if you want, but here it just allows them to read it until they feel comfortable. They say they're done, and now they find out what the actual task was, which is not just to answer any question about it, but it's actually to reproduce the passage verbatim. Um, so I, I didn't actually read it, but it's like a story about tennis. Um, I'm just going like, to write the number one here so that you can see that, like, just so I can keep track of how far in the chain I am. I'm going to uh, submit. There's uh, this debriefing form. I'm going to click continue. And you just see like some more stuff happened. And what just, act what just happened, I'm going to go back one browser window. It says it like brought me to the end of the experiment. If I go back to the debug session in the terminal, you'll see that there's a new recruitment request. Um, and so what happened is that it noticed that the first participant in the chain had submitted their, their response in which case that automatically, because this is a, I'll show you the code in a second, but because it's a transmission chain, that event triggers a new event. That new event is recruit a new participant, add them to the end of the chain. So, and so uh, the, the debug window noticed that and so popped open a new browser window. And so now we're gonna begin the experiment as the second participant, we'll consent again, we'll begin. And now when it says to read the following text, we don't see the original ground truth, we see the story that the first participant did. Uh, so I'm just going to continue. Uh, I'll just I'll just do I'll just increment it so we can just see that it's new. I'll click through it and then bam, we just have a third one open. Um, it's just happening fast enough that you don't see it switching back to this. But like there's another a new recruitment request. Begin, agree, begin. Now it's story two because I'm reading not the original, not the first participant, but the second participant. Story three. Hopefully this isn't too long. I'm just gonna click through these just to show you that it, it continues all the way to the end of the chain. I think this chain's probably five or six long. Okay, and then it says thanks for your participation and it didn't pop open a new window. Um, so that suggests that it's probably done. Um, I'm gonna go back to the original window and we'll see that it says recruitment is complete, waiting for experiment completion, experiment summary. It says that there, the status of it is successful. There's no more nodes required. There's no unfilled networks. Here we were just doing one chain, one network. Um, it is completed, there's no nodes remaining. The summary is that there were four participants and they were all approved. Experiment's completed, all the nodes are filled, completed the debugging of the experiment with ID, that cleaning up the Heroku process, local Heroku process terminated, and it returns. Okay, and so now we've completed the experiment, it's automated the, the entire thing. I, I was, this was a debug session, so like I participated as the participant, um, but we can go and now I'm just gonna open up a database viewer to just show you that the, um, the it's a little small to see. Uh, see what I can do. Ooh, okay. Um, I'm going to open up this. These are the tables in the database. They represent the basic objects of the Dowinger world. And uh, we, we, I mentioned a few of them. There's, there's a network that contains the participants. What are those participants? They are nodes in the network. Um, there's this distinction between a participant and a node because you can have one human come to your task and participate as though they were in multiple networks, right? Like, it's the equivalent of just doing multiple trials. You can run multiple parallel uh, uh, experiments, essentially, or multiple parallel chains. And so you could have one participant that participated as many nodes. Um, and so each of these is a table. We can open it up and look. And here's the info table. There's five items in it. If we look all, all the way here to the right, there's the original. It's the story about tennis. Um, there's the contents of the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. So this just confirms that it recorded, recorded our data and that it, it, it got through the whole experiment. Okay, so that is um, one, I have to zoom back out. Um, I'm gonna close all these windows because they're just still around. Head back to, um, ooh. and head back to uh, this description of, of the steps that it took. But what we just saw was, um, 
the arrow is running it through the command line interface, and so it's not looking for the data, but it, it spawned the web server. That web server was local. It sourced the participants. Those participants were me. It obtained my informed consent. It arranged me into the various parts of the, of the chain. Um, it ran through the entire experiment. It uh, debriefed the, me. It paid. Well, here, here because it's in a debug session, it's not actually paying anybody, um, but it, there's some logging messages about what it would have done. Um, it conditionally recruited a new participant for each next element of the chain. Eventually it stopped the experiment and then eventually it returned. Um, what's nice is that to run this exact experiment on the uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk sandbox or live um, requires no modification other than to just change the word debug to uh, sandbox. Um, in a few minutes, I will show you a different demo that I <laughs> A little afraid to do it because live demos are scary, but I'll give it a try, which is for all of us to participate in uh, an experiment to generate a fairly big data set. Okay. Any questions? Okay, I'll keep going and I'll ask again. Okay. So what we just saw was the automation of a pretty simple experiment. It was the automation of a transmission chain where it starts with some source material, it recruits a participant to observe the source material to, and to create a reproduction, then recruits a new participant, adds them to the end of the chain, and runs the chain forward until the chain reaches its pre-specified maximum length, in which case it is done. In the context of thinking about big data or even just bigger data, this is really quite small data. The entire data set is described by just the network structure of a chain. And the material is uh, a story and four reproductions of that story. This is about the scale that um, you would get if you were to run this in the lab, right? You would generate a data set. The data set would mostly just contain the stories that the participants were produced and some meta metadata about them. What's interesting, though, is that Having, having automated the entire process, you can create bigger data, not by requiring any bigger investment in, in time or, or, or effort or, um, or, or anything really. Um, you can create bigger data by just adding more zeros to a configuration file. Um, so if instead of running a five person experiment, we wanted to run a 50 person chain, uh, all you really need to do is add a zero in the configuration file that says how many participants you want to run. So that instead of five, it's 50. Um, and the automation handles the rest. There's nothing inherently different about running 50 in a row than running uh, five in a row. And so the system will just proceed along um, and, and collect 50. Um, okay, and so the next thing I want to talk about is just pushing in the direction of bigger and bigger data. There's the, there's the simple way to do it, which is not to change the structure of an experiment or anything that you're recording really, but just to run the same kinds of experiments with, uh, with uh, a greater number of participants. Um, but there's, but, but uh, experimentation on the web provides opportunities to really collect a lot of data about human behavior in an online experiment. Um, and so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, using Dallinger to collect data of a scale that's a bit larger than what's typically generated in a laboratory experiment. Um, and because the data collection is automated, it'll mean that increasing the scale even further is, again, mostly just a matter of changing the configuration. So I'm going to show you an, another demo, which is uh, Grid Universe. And this is a, instead of just being one game, it's actually a whole design space of games. And by design space, I just mean that it's a game that has parameters. And those parameters control actually quite important aspects of the gameplay. Um, the, the name uh, uh, Grid Universe uh, draws inspiration from grid worlds, which are toy problems commonly used to uh, study sequential decision making under uncertainty in the context of reinforcement learning. Um, and the basic setup is that in a grid world, the player moves around the grid, collecting some reward, uh, and the player's goal is to maximize the reward. So what I'm just going to show you is like what this game, what this game looks like in a single player context. Uh, I'm going to go over to the configuration file. You'll see that it looks exactly like there's a couple of different words on the, in the configuration file, but um, pretty much all of the knowledge you learn about SciTurk 
transfers directly over. I'd say 95% of it is immediately applicable because it has much of the same structure of, of using that, what I think is a, is a quite nice idea of thinking about these things as cartridges where you, uh, you just move around into a directory and you can run the, the program from within that directory or go somewhere else and run, and run a different experiment from within a different uh, directory. Um, so I am going to show you the configuration file for the grid universe just to make sure I am recruiting the right number of people. I'm going to set the number of participants to one, that's just me. I'll make the game short, this is the, no, this is the length of the game in, uh, in seconds, so I'll make it short so that I don't, I don't have to sit here playing for a long time. And now I'll just run it to show you what it looks like. Uh, I'm going to move over to the correct directory. Uh, here I am inside the, the experiment directory, it has that config file. Um, and I'll run the exact same thing, which is Dallinger debug, and I wanted to just print lots of uh, debugging information. And you'll see it goes through the, exactly the same process. So here it says, thanks for accepting the hit. We're going to begin the experiment. There's a consent form. I'm going to agree. There's some instructions. Uh, roughly the instructions say, move around the grid and get some points by collecting the food. And here I am, a player, on a grid. I'm the yellow one, and I can move around in real time and collect the data, and collect the, uh, the food. Why this is interesting, oh, there's also a chat room down here. I happen to be alone, but um, by default, there's a chat room here, and I can say hi, um, and it assigns me a pseudonym. I'm not sure where the locale of the pseudonym is, but it, it assigns me a, a, a pseudonym. Um, so I can, I can move around the grid collecting food. Um, and what's interesting here, okay, and then I ran out of time. I didn't, I didn't uh, score very high, but, and then now the entire game is over. Okay, this was the default setting of this grid universe game, but what I want to show you, and what makes this interesting, is, uh, is two things. First, is that it is a parametric design space of games, and many of the games control quite fundamental aspects of the gameplay. Um, so I'm going to just scroll down here and show you some of the parameters that I think are, are most interesting. Um, so this isn't particularly interesting, but it at least will, it, it, um, it's easy to imagine, which is the player moves around at, at, at some maximum speed. Uh, this sets the maximum speed. But there's many other things that actually control very fundamental aspects of the gameplay. Um, so for example, um, Here's a parameter called frequency dependence. What this is, is let's say you have a game with multiple players. The question is, uh, and each one is randomly assigned a color, um, do you get points for being in the majority or do you get points for being in the minority? Um, and that's a common experimental setup used in experimental economics um, to study uh, uh, the formation of, of, of groups. Uh, similarly, there's, there's um, there's parameters like food PG multiplier, which determines whether or not the food is uh, an individual uh, is an individual gain or if it's like a, a public good. So that consumption of it um, actually uh, is individually costly but benefits the group. Um, and there are there are there are a, a whole bunch of these. Okay, why this is bigger data is that this is a, this is not a tightly controlled experiment where you are measuring one particular response on each trial um, and then analyzing it using, a, a, like using um, a, a, a specific tool. What you actually get in the data set of a grid universe experiment is a, a time series of the state of the game. So every time anybody takes any action in the game, moving their avatar in one direction or another, uh, typing a message into the chat room, that just gets recorded. Similarly, every 50 milliseconds, the entire game state, the entire board is, is, is saved into the database. And so what you end up with is this data set that's actually quite, uh, quite a bit larger than, than what we saw with the transmission chain, such that instead of it being uh, like, in, like, like five kilobytes, you actually have like maybe 20 megabytes of data just from a, a five minute game. And what's interesting there is because this is all automated, you can scale up in, in several different directions. You can scale up in the direction of having many players. You can scale up in the direction of having many iterations of the game uh, side by side or, or one after the next. 
Um, and what you will end up with, depending on the structure of the particular experiment, is actually a quite large data set where you have to start thinking about the same kinds of things that, um, that, that, you, that you deal with in, in larger naturally occurring data sets, which is what are the right questions to ask? Um, like, um, in, in fact, like some of these, some of these, um, some of these uh, settings of these parameters can produce games that are complex enough that it's not clear that all the participants know what the rule, rules are in advance, and it's not exactly clear what behavior would be. You can start to do something that is that bridges between experimental work and observational work, where you know, in some sense, it's strongly experimental. We're we're choosing the the, the settings, we're choosing the structure of the game. But it might be the case that we that it, that it, that, we're, that it's quite exploratory, and we don't know what kind of behavior any one circumstance is going to generate. Um, okay, for the purposes of time, I'm going to save possibly playing a large version of this to the end, um, and I'm going to just continue on the path uh, on the on the path where we don't quite play it yet, um, just because that'll probably take ten minutes or so, and I give it like a fifty percent chance of completely exploding, so better to learn stuff than to watch a computer program fail. Um, okay, the next thing I want to talk about is algorithmic experimentation of a different kind. So we saw how the experiment.collect method automates the end-to-end -end pipeline of experimentation, everything from spawning a web server to returning the data. And what's interesting is that having abstracted that pipeline into a single function call, it becomes possible to actually insert that function call into algorithms, which is to say that it's a different kind of, uh, kind of um, algorithmic experimentation where instead of the particular um, like experiment having, the, having like, uh, an equivalence in an algorithm, you're actually using existing algorithms to determine how you uh, decide what experiment to run next. Um, okay, here's a very, very minimal example where you have a fixed set of uh, there's some parameter space that you want to just sweep across, um, and this is an example of just uh, uh, looping over them to, ex to uh, go through that entire space. So you import Dallinger, experiment equals Dallinger that experiments at grid universe. Um, here, uh, we're controlling the number of rounds in the game, um, and we're going to say we want to test three conditions, 10, 20, and 40 rounds, and then for each one, we just, uh, we just we loop through it. And the point of showing you this is less of, like this is not a particularly interesting kind of uh, it's not a particularly interesting example of algorithmic experimentation, but it, it just shows you the, the ease of using this kind of pipeline and the power of having abstracted everything into a single function call. Once you've once you've abstracted everything into a, a function call, the kinds of experiments you do are just limited by the kinds of uh, algorithms you can think of where where it would be useful to insert an experiment into them. Um, and so let's just. Think about a couple, let me just give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, Vishal is going to show you uh, a third example in a second. But um, one kind of experimentation that this enables is uh, using an optimization algorithm. So let's say you have some huge, like, let's say you want to understand how eight different factors affect some outcome measure. And in fact, what you really want to know is which of those, um, which of those factors has the biggest influence on the outcome measure. The this, this space that you're interested in trying to explore might be so big that it's unreasonable to exhaustively uh, test every point within it. And so using some kind of optimization algorithm where you adaptively adjust which experiment to run next by choosing an experiment that, uh, that you think is going to produce a quite large effect um, is as simple as just find the right optimization algorithm and insert the, your experiment into it. Uh, a second example might be a search algorithm. Let's say you're interested in understanding, uh, you're interested in finding an experimental manipulation that meets some certain condition. Like uh, you want to see what value, what value produces an outcome measure that's at least a, a, a certain value. Um, rather than exhaustively sweeping through them, you can smartly search the space um, using any known search algorithm. Um, and I'm being kind of abstract about this in that, like, in that really there are quite few limitations. These are just computer programs. Once you've abstracted it into a function call, you, you can at least, you could do whatever you wanted with it. Um, what, I'm gonna, what Vishal is gonna tell you about next is kind of bringing it back to that example of interactive evolutionary computation um, to show you an example of using a kind of rich multiplayer game like Grid Universe insert, and, and uh, performing evolutionary computation over like a, a, a social game. Go for it. 
Um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is how we used interactive evolutionary computation on Grid Universe. And so, just to remind you, the purpose of Grid Universe, uh, or the purpose of interactive evolutionary computation, is to optimize a set of parameters in a design space in order for you to maximize a participant's subjective evaluation. And so, in the case of Grid Universe, what we did was we used the design space of um, the multiple parameters that you could have seen when Jordan had the grid up. So that includes things like the number of rows, the number of columns, uh, the time per round, um, how much food was available in the experiment. Um, one second. Uh, and so in, in Grid Universe, what we did was, so the evolutionary algorithm, what it did was it's run in an n by n loop. And n is the number of players that uh, begin uh, the experiment. And the m is the number of generations that that experiment loops for. Uh, so I'm going to define something called a, a genome, which is super essential to the evolutionary algorithm. So the genome is the set of parameters in the uh, experiment that define these variables that I talked about earlier, the parameters such as uh, time per round, color, uh, the amount of food in the environment. And so uh, by altering these parameters, we can sort of uh, get feedback from the player to know which one of those parameters were most successful in uh, being the most fun for a uh, participant. Um, and so what we did was, uh, so in the first generation, what happens is that these genomes, these parameters, are randomly initialized. And you could sort of normalize the values so that they're not too ridiculous, like a, like a row and column that's one by one or something. Um, and so, uh, those randomly initialized genomes then are um, each their own experiment. So we started off with 10 separate experiments in generation one. And when these participants played through each of these randomly initialized genomes, what ended up happening was uh, they, uh, you see a certain rate of survival for each of the um, experiments. Those experiments that survive then go on to pass on their genes, uh, which is their genome, although we set a hyperparameter for mutation, which could allow the genome to be slightly altered depending on uh, just what you set it to. So if you set it to 0.2, for example, there's a 20% chance that the, the genome might be uh, randomly initialized rather than it being a direct replica of the parent generation. And so over the course of 10 generations, what we would expect to see is uh, sort of the most fun that we could get with the parameters that we started off with. Um, and so I think that this really shows uh, a, an interesting feature of Dallinger, which is that you're, you're almost experimenting with uh, your experiment. It's, it's like this sort of meta-analysis of what you're doing, because you're, you're looking at the parameters that uh, make your experiment um, sort of optimize it for this qualitative uh, variable that is, is really hard to measure. And when you can do this so iteratively and uh, with such a large pool of, of participants, I think that you can uh, collect some very interesting data on uh, what would be, you know, the, the most, in our example, is the most fun, but you can do what's uh, most difficult or most engaging. Uh, yeah, and so that's one example with interactive evolutionary computation. Now I'll get back to Jordan. Cool, thanks. Yeah, we're gonna take a we're gonna take a like a five minute break, and we'll come back with some uh, ideas about uh, reproducibility in the behavioral behavioral and social sciences and uh, data migration tools. Okay, we'll be back.
All right, how many of you have uh, MTurk worker sandbox accounts? Yeah. Like, how many of you could get on the worker sandbox now? Yeah. I guess. Does anybody have a MTurk like requester account of some kind? Okay. If you if you have any of these things, let's do a live game. I'm gonna see if we can get. Oh, okay. All right, we're going to start again. Ooh, it's not nice. Okay, so I'm going to start this, uh, this, this, this section by uh, running one of these games live so you can see it hopefully at least get up there, and then we'll see if the game itself is, is, is playable with a bunch of people. Um, so here I am in that directory which has my game. Uh, I'm going to show you that there's like this, there's this big file that control that uh, called experiment.py that just has all the logic within it. There's this huge thing with all, all the gameplay. There, and then there's a config file and that's the thing I'm going to control. I'm going to have 60 participants. I mean, this, we're, we're just doing this in the sandbox so just whoever shows up to it will say max, maximum 60, it doesn't really matter. Um, this controls the size of the grid, how much one point is worth in terms of dollars, and how long a round is. Let's make that, make, we'll make that significantly longer. We'll make it just continue for a long time. Um, and uh, if that should be enough. I, I named the game Grid Universe Data on the Mind. Um, that should be enough where now, here I am, I should be able to just Dallinger uh, Sandbox verbose. And that's going to kick off a chain of events that should launch the experiment, not live, but on the Mechanical Turk sandbox. I'm going to just move away from that window for just a minute because Heroku has this thing where they print environment va variables directly to the console, which is totally fine when I'm just on my own computer. But when I'm when we're broadcasting something via the internet, it was going to show Amazon Web Services, like passwords and things like that. Um, and so I'm just going to stay away from that for at least just like 30 seconds while I just describe what it as is doing, which is, you know, you saw all that output when you debug. It just it's doing that exact same thing. There's just a couple of extra things that it also does when you run the experiments uh, on the sandbox. And that's because instead of it using your local server, it's actually provisioning a, a database. It's Cloud and cloud server resources and running your game uh, there. And so it just goes through those steps of, um, of creating the database, et cetera. Okay, I'll just wait for it. <coughs> um, okay, in the meantime, while that's launching, typically takes three to five minutes to launch, something that we're trying to decrease as much as possible because if you run lots of these things in a loop, what you want as little overhead as possible. But five minutes is pretty good because it's, it's still usually much less than the amount of time that we actually have to wait for people to actually finish it, which uh, th that is one interesting point, actually. One of, the, one of the rate limiting factors in running sequential experiments like transmission chains is that not every participant who you recruit actually makes it to the end of the experiment and finishes. The worst thing, that, and, and we, we conditionally recruit people who don't make it to the end, uh, like we recruit replacements, but what can happen? And this is exactly this is exactly what limits the, the the throughput of one of these chains. Is let's say you give um, a person 30 minutes to do the task. They have the choice to start it whenever they want. They may start it 20 minutes in, knowing that it's only going to take them five minutes or so, or maybe even less. They wait 20 minutes. Let's say they misjudge and they actually take too long and they time out. What happens is then we then go recruit somebody in their place. That person has 30 minutes to do the task, and what if this? And this could technically happen in a nested way. And so, what we've, as we've measured it in doing chains that are quite long, we've we've run chains across people that are 300 people long, um, and we've run, uh, and and what we've noticed about the rate limiting factors of of this is exactly that of, like the 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 worst thing, the thing that we have to try to avoid is recruiting a replacement of a replacement. Um, it's just that that takes a. a that means that something that might have really only take three minutes of human decision time might take an hour to finish the entire generation. And it's still pretty fast, right? You can get through 
300 people in, I don't know, a week or so, if it's actually taking each one an hour. Um, but, but we could go faster if there were ways to improve that aspect. Um, okay, so we're past the keys now. It's just still installing it like, it's actually provisioning the web server and installing all of the requirements on it. And so I'm gonna move now while this is, while this is loading, because once it loads, it'll be fine. Um, well, I'll just, I'll go back to it and we can, um, we can just start all at the same time. Um, what I wanna talk about is how automation does a lot to promote reproducibility, uh, period. Um, and so what I wanna go through is there's this great article this, this, the, the following is adapted from, from this, this great article called 10 Simple Rules for Reproducible Computational Research. And what I think is interesting about this is that there's, there's really two different ways that um, reproducibility matters here. One piece of it is that often you run an experiment, you get some data, and now you are doing something inherently computational. We, this, 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 this tutorial has been full of computational tools for analyzing different kinds of data. And so you are doing something that would benefit from using best practices in computational research. On top of that, I think a lot of the ideas from, computation, from the computational concept of reproducibility can be applied to actual experiments and, act, and the way that we actually run experiments, uh, the way that we document them and the way that they are carried out. And so this article is 10 Simple Rules for Reproducible Computational Research. And I wanna just go through them and talk about how the tools that, that you've learned over the past couple of days um, are really excellent for promoting uh, the, the strictest definitions of computational reproducibility, both for your analyses and then with something like Dallinger, perhaps even with experiments. Um, so here is one, well, here's one very specific definition of computational reproducibility. It's the one that's used by reproduciblebuilds.org. They define it as a reproducible build is a set of software development practices that create a verifiable path from human readable source code to the binary code used by computers. Translating that to uh, like experimental data analysis, what that is is it's a path from the raw data to the actual reported results in a paper. Having a verifiable path, meaning verifiable in the sense of, um, you know, like you've done that analysis, a third party should be able to say, prove to me that this, these reports, that th these results in the paper are the result of the uh, analysis pipeline that you say it is. Okay, and so how, how, how can we get there? The, the, the thing with Dallinger like, is perhaps maybe even taking that one step further, which would be if you can actually define, and, and with Scikit too, if you can define the entire experiment in code, you might be able to create a verifiable path, not just from the raw data, to the results, but a verifiable path from the definition of the experiment to the results. Okay, uh, let me just do a little check on the, uh, on the progress. Oh, it completed. So let's just take a little break there before we go through those 10. And what you should do is go to the Mechanical Turk Worker Sandbox. You will open up um, the task. You're looking for Grid Universe DOTM. You will accept the hit. Um, you will sign in if you are not already signed in. I have to type in front of people. You won't see anything, but I have to, typing under pressure. Uh, sign in, there's a call for participants, you'll accept the hit. Whoever gets there first is the one that's gonna launch it. I, I, I didn't set up a waiting room so that we're just all, so that we can just participate without having to time everything, but like, uh, like first one in gets, gets to be the only participant there to start with. Um, we'll begin. Okay, here I am. Is anybody else here? Oh, there is somebody. Ha, huh, this worked. <laughs> uh, these are all pseudonyms, by the way, so you don't need to worry that your um, identity is not being revealed. Um, in fact, the, the, that's another interesting question that, that is not for today, but is an interesting discussion of, of practices in like maintaining confidentiality of personally identifiable information and thinking about when you're doing experimental work or even when you're doing uh, analysis of naturally occurring data sets. It's great that there's only two people here. I'm just winning now, I'm doing great. <laughs> Anybody else, is, did, did, it, did it not work for other people or, just, or maybe other people don't have accounts or? Oh, all right, well, me and George Williams will just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Hopefully they're online so that they don't know that I'm, it's a fake because I want them to go there. So I got them. Oh. Yeah. So, so like this is right, this is like a, a quite minimal game here. This is like this is and this is just one setting of these particular parameters. It's a it's a multiplayer game where there's where we're tiles or we're squares on a grid. We each have an identity, a color that's assigned to us, and we have a chat room. Um, I can, I can, but um, there's many parameters that control, like you know, the number of players and quite important things. I can start engaging in antisocial behavior. Maybe this is social behavior. I can try to beat them there and just harass them or something, or I can, <laughs> or I can, I can be very cooperative and I can say, oh, you know, like I'll just let them have everything that's down there, and uh, and oh, see, like I'll, I'll let them have it, or oh. well, now they're now they're chasing me. <laughs> Yeah, it, it feels, it feels, it, oh, there's a third. Oh. Say hello. Oh, a fourth. Okay, this is going well now. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, yeah, like, like, you, you, like, just in watching this, there's like, you can observe lots of stuff. This, uh, it feels a lot like the um, Hyder and Simmel videos where you're, you're watching, like, uh, you're kind of baking in a lot of narrative into something that is really just quite simple in its, in its, in its surface, like, motion, right? Like, like, without the chat room, this is just squares moving around a, a bigger square. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, okay, so uh, this game is going to go on for a while, so I'll let everybody else play, but I will um, talk over it. Um, uh, so uh, just one interesting thing is this, is, this is every 50 milliseconds it's collecting the entire game state, and every single key press that anybody does gets logged. So this is a, a 10 minute game. By the end of it, it'll have like about 100 megabytes worth of game state data. A lot of that will be quite redundant in that like there's pieces of food that just sit there while nobody, nobody consumes them for a minute or so. Um, and so it's quite compressible, but in terms of like the size of a data set, we've already just gone by, by playing a 10 minute, one 10 minute game where, um, where we're collecting real time uh, data, we're already at a, maybe a factor of 100 or 1,000 bigger than the previous experiments that I showed you. Okay, so uh, you can keep playing if you're playing, don't, I, don't, I don't mind. Um, rule number one is of, of computational reproducibility for analyses is, is for every result, keep track of how it was produced. I think there's been a solution presented to that, to that, to that uh, or a, a way to follow that rules was presented, which is use a Jupyter notebook. That's a great way to keep track of how your results were produced. Um, and it, it makes sense why you'd want to do that. Um, I think one important thing is like noting how results were, were, were produced is useful not just for um, others so that they can do the same thing too, but it's really useful for future self who might as well be another person, right? It's, it's the same thing as like providing good documentation for software. It's good to provide good documentation for analyses so that if either in three months from now after you, you, know, you, you sent the paper, you, you wrote a paper, you sent it out for review, you get the reviews back, you haven't thought about them in a little while, you can just get right back up to speed. Or maybe you know, five years down the line you wanna run a variant of an experiment and it would be better not to have to start from scratch. Uh, so recording the analyses alongside, like a Jupyter Notebook's nice because you can include text right alongside the code. Okay, avoid manual data manipulation steps. This one's simple. If you did it by hand and you weren't recording everything you did, how will anybody else reproduce it? And for digital data, if you were recording everything you did, why not put it in a, in a format that allows you to actually just automate that analysis? Um, and so to follow this rule, one thing you could do would be to record all of your analysis steps in a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, calling out to external scripts whenever you need. So if you have some custom tool or you have some specific tool that isn't, you can't put into a notebook or you can't put into a standalone script, you could, you, you could, you could figure out some way to link them in a way that does as much as possible to, meet, to make, it, make sure that like, you aren't downloading the data and then going in by hand and doing a certain thing. Anything that you can, figure out how to define it programmatically and, have, and do it there instead. That makes it easier for you to reproduce if you need to do small variants of something. And it also just takes away, um, uh, like it, it, it just makes it easier to verify the, the, the path from the raw data to the results. Rule three is archive the exact version of all external programs used. Um, you see, you, you saw that uh, well, you, or if you if you look around the uh, repository for this uh, for this workshop, you'll see that many people included a requirements file. Um, that will contain the names of, of the software dependencies. And in many of those, like for Python at least, and I'm sure R has something that's very similar, um, you can actually do something called like pinning the dependencies, which is to specify the version of it in the code, um, like in the, in the requirements file. Um, and so uh, why don't you try that right now, which is um, look around those repositories, 
or look online to figure out what a requirements.txt file is for Python and create one that pins a specific version of pandas and requests. Uh, these are just two, you, you've seen pandas before, and I think you, you, you may have even seen requests sometime during this tutorial. It's just something that allows you to make, it's a Python library that allows you to make HTTP requests to external servers, like an API if you're trying to scrape Twitter. Um, I'm just having a little trouble remembering if we use that particular tool, but these are, those are two tools that you might definitely use in data analysis. Um, Sometimes there's going to be uh, requirements that you aren't able to specify in like a Python requirements file or the, the R equivalents. And for those, um, one option is to, is to look into Docker. That's a, it's, it's quite heavy machinery and there's like a lot to learn there to get, to get started with it. But it is probably a, a quite nice solution to um, uh, specifying version, versions of things that you used. Um, okay. Rule four, this one's easy to follow, version control all custom scripts. So the idea is any code that you write should be version, versioned so that you can keep track of the exact code that was run to produce experimental results and analyses. Uh, so a really common technique is to copy and paste the entire analysis pipeline into a new directory, appending a, 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 a unique identifier such as analysis new for version two and analysis new new for version three. And it is true that that is better than nothing. Like if, if, if it was between that and not keeping different versions of things separate, um, do the adding multiple news to the end, it's definitely better than nothing, but it does protect, tend to produce a mess of easily confusable directories, um, bloated directories and inconsistencies, specifically like you, know, you create four versions of something that are slight variants of the same analysis, you find a bug in the fourth one that actually applied to all the other three, like you go back and fix all the other ones, it's much easier to do if you have like a versioning system that allows you to control that. Um, so use a proper version control system. As of 2017, it's probably worth starting with Git, which is pretty much, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a standard. Um, at least for me, the learning curve has been particularly shallow, meaning like I started with it several years ago and still am at like 60% capacity. Uh, maybe that's also just like the tool is quite deep in the stuff that you could do with it. Um, but it's, it's, you might consider like instead of just learning by trial and error, using one of the many resources out there to learn it well. Um, one that I really like and I think is a cool idea is called GitHub. Um, it's actually a command line utility that is like a training tool where they give you exercises and you do it on the spot. And there's like 75 different exercises that go through basic Git functionality to all the way to like the depths of Git that one never wants to see. Um, and it's a cool training tool. You can even, if you, if you made it all the way through, you could start to use it as like a, like you could just use it as like a review every once in a while. Uh, a good first goal would be to learn the vocabulary, what a repository, what the words repository, clone, stage, commit, push, pull, origin, master, remote, local, merge, and rebase mean. Uh, okay, I'm gonna pause for one second just to check on the status of the game because I would like to show you how we get back the data. Um, see how we're doing. Oh, 17 seconds, what good timing. Oh. Margaret Chapman, strong language. <laughs> okay, so the game is finished. Each of us will fill out this form. Uh, I just declined to fill it out. Click compete. Um, maybe I'll even pop open my email because this has automated bonusing too. People probably did pretty well because it was a long game and I didn't tune it in any way. But anybody who participated should get an email, essentially immediately, because it, like you, you heard earlier that Todd was mentioning that it was important to, um, to like, there's this kind of like human management side of things, which is participants are real people and they'll get really annoyed if they're doing work for you and, and participating and you're not compensating them or the experiment breaks or something bad happens. This is kind of a cool hack that does the best one could possibly do in terms of paying people. You create automated checks that determine whether or not they performed at a certain level. You give them the bonus, they get the bonus immediately. Like I already have in my email, I'm just gonna double check to make sure that it's like, okay, I just opened my email. But, um, uh, has any, did, did anybody finish the game and get an email? Yeah, I got a dollar thirteen. Good job, yeah. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll put it up there. Um, see, this just happened like a minute ago. Mechanical Turk, you received the bonus. I got 19 cents. 
Right? It's like this is just all automatic. It's not like there's like somebody behind the scenes like sending bonuses to everybody. It just it just does it, and that's that makes the the people who are participating feel feel really good that like they know that when they participate in your hits, you're going to pay them, and you're paying them the amount that you said you would, and they can feel secure in doing your experiments in the future. And that, that gives your account like a really good reputation on the system. It makes it easier for you to recruit more participants, uh, et cetera. OK, I'm glad that worked. I'm a little surprised, but great. Um, that's actually the first time we've run that experiment with more than two or three people, because we just don't have, like, it's, the, the, one of the hardest things to do is to actually like, test a, a live multiplayer game, because I usually just only have me, and I can open a few browsers and like, test it out like that, but I can't actually like, sit there and hit multiple key, like, four different keyboards at the same time, and even if I get another person to help me with it, I can't, you know. And so that was actually, that was, we, we've, we've tested the scalability of, of how many people we can simultaneously recruit, and there we, we can do like at least 60 or so, but that's the first time we've ever run this particular uh, game using any more than just like two people at a time. Okay, rule number five is record all intermediate results when possible in standardized formats. Uh, so they, they say, quote, in principle, as long as the full process used to produce a given result is tracked, all intermediate data can also be regenerated. In practice, having easily accessible intermediate results may be of great value. Um, and so we're a little bit low on time, and so I'm just gonna give you, I'm gonna answer the exercise for you. I don't know of too many examples in like, uh, well, I'll, I'll, here's one example where I, that I do know of where intermediate, computing intermediate results is really useful. In fMRI analysis, it's very often the case that um, there is a lot of computation involved to go from the raw images it collects, the volumes that it collects, to the plot in a, in a, in a figure. Um, and uh, what that means, and some of it doesn't, like, rarely needs to be repeated. And so what will, like, if, if there, there's a choice there, one thing you could do is you just have a pipeline that doesn't store any immediate results, and if you want to make one little tweak to the very final stage of it, you have to just run the entire thing again and, and wait a week or a day or however long it takes. Um, or the alternative is to save intermediate results so that you know maybe it's maybe you save it at five different stages along the processing and so if you just need to tweak one little thing at the end all you have to do is regenerate the fourth and fifth or something like that um, and that, it's mostly just an efficiency thing I don't think that's necessarily that important for reproducibility per se um, but it uh, just because it is at least logically possible to reproduce it um, but it's more of a convenience thing and something that's that's a useful practice okay this one's good Rule number six, for analyses that include randomness, note underlying random seeds. This goes in two directions. So many experiments in the behavior, behavioral and social sciences make use of randomness. So for example, to assign participants to conditions. Most modern programming languages have really good support for random number generation. Python certainly does, R certainly has it. Um, but care must be taken to ensure reproducibility. And there's two things that can go wrong. The first is that you can fail to record the seed in which case you're losing information needed to reproduce the experiment or analysis exactly. And I'll describe what a seed is exactly in a second. But, and the second is that you can fail to change the seed when you do want a fresh batch of random, random numbers. So the way that random numbers are generated by computers usually is that they have some iterative algorithm that generates a random number and then deterministically generates another random number given the first one. It, it, the, like the random number generation procedure is deterministic. It's just that the statistical properties of the numbers that it generates are good in that it, it like they are they are good random numbers. However, what that means is like if you start in the same place of the chain, you will get exactly the same numbers back. And let me just prove that to you. So like here, I'm going to show you how to seed the random number generator in Python. Um, import random, random.seed. I've now seeded the random number generator. And so now I'm going to generate some random numbers. OK, here's some random numbers. Starts with 0 0.776438. OK, so next we're going to seed to the same value again and recreate that once we get quote unquote random numbers, they're identical to the ones we had before. So I'm going to reset the random seed and regenerate them. And there it is, right? They're, they're exactly the same numbers. So in what sense are they random? It's not that they're generated anew each time. It's the actual random number generator is deterministic given the seed, the starting state. Um, and uh, so what that means is if you actually want new values, you have to change the seed. Um, there are certain software packages that just like every time you open them up for the first time, they just start with a fixed seed. Uh, that's particularly bad. Slightly better would be to use some like actual randomness there. 
um, a very common technique is just to seed it with the current time, um, which at least is not never going to be the same um, uh, from one iteration to the next unless you're doing messed up things with the clock. Um, and so the, the important thing is really just uh, to save that somewhere because if you save it somewhere, it means that you can actually get bitwise identical output when you run the analysis again. You just change that you set the seed back to where it was, and every single random number will be generated exactly the same way. Sometimes you don't want that, in which case you have to change the seed. But if you do want it, you should. You should. Uh, here's just the proof, like r equals r2, yes. And if you compare with a friend, you'll see that they got the same numbers too. All right, right at the end here. Rule seven is always store raw data behind plots. Um, I don't know why I said even better, always store the raw data. I think it, maybe the original said always store the data behind the plots. I'm just gonna say like store it as early as you can. Like ideally before any person has touched it, maybe you just have an entire pipeline that doesn't involve people touching it, but the earlier you can save it, the better um, in that it's easier to move forward, but it's very often once you haven't saved the raw data, it's often impossible to retrieve it. And so if you save it, that's good. Um, I'm just, here's just a shout out to some places where you could store data. You could store data in Git. If it's very big, it's a little hard. There's a system called Git large file storage you could use. But a, a nice option I think now is um, the open science framework, which uh, has two benefits. One is that they allow you to store large data files. And the second is that they have an endowment and their endowment is meant to ensure that your data is not gonna go away even if open science framework goes away. And that's pretty rare. There are some repositories at certain universities that will guarantee stuff like that, but I don't actually think Berkeley is one of them, and I don't know if your university is one either. Um, it is a little tricky to find a place that will allow you to like prepay for 100 years of data storage. Um, for good reason, right? It's a hard thing to guarantee you can do. Um, Okay, rule eight, generate hierarchical analysis output allowing layers of increasing detail to be inspected. This is um, a little less about computational reproducibility in the sense of being able to get back the exact output and more one of um, inspectability. So the idea here is, let's say that um, you have a plot and the plot has six different panels on it, each of which is showing a different condition. Their recommendation is to have a tool that allows you to click on one of those plots or d dive deeper onto one of the plots, any one of the plots, and see one layer further closer to the raw data. Um, and the, so the suggestion is to just like have a tool that allows you to peel back a layer of processing if you want to see what it actually looked like underneath. I think that's useful. Okay, number nine is, con is uh, connect textual statements to underlying results. Uh, Sometimes they can get out of sync. That same thing can happen with software. Your, your documentation can get out of sync with the code, um, and that should be considered a bug. Uh, or in the case of uh, research uh, analysis, it should be considered a problem. If, if, the, if, if you have a Jupyter notebook, for example, even if you have a Jupyter notebook that has text analysis, text analysis, text analysis, if they don't match, there's a question about which one's right. Is it that you meant to do the thing you did in the code and the text is wrong? Or is it you meant to do the thing in the text and the code is wrong. I got it right, right. Um, okay. Uh, okay, that's number nine. And number 10, which is uh, quite useful, which is provide public access to scripts, runs, and results. Uh, they say, quote, last but not least, all input data, scripts, versions, parameters, and intermediate results should be made publicly <coughs> and easily accessible. I think this one is tricky. Is That's a really easy thing to fulfill with, like, uh, with computational sciences, like, uh, you know, measuring data about stars. The stars don't care whether you, whether you record information about them, but there are a lot of laws, rules, best practices associated with storing human subjects data. And there are just, there are many, many kinds of uh, research that I'm sure some of you do where it's not okay to store all scripts, runs, and results. For example, we cannot store all of the data that we record in the database for, um, for, for Dallinger, and that's because it does contain uh, personally identifiable information in the form of mechanical Turk worker IDs, which in combination with other information have often been shown to uh, be personally identifiable. And so our tool actually like scrubs that data and replaces their worker IDs with just uh, numbers, um, either random numbers or in this case, just their, their numeric ID. Um, okay, so this experiment ended. I'm just gonna show you Really quickly, I'm just going to show you how to get the data back, um, which is Dallinger export app. There's the app. 
this is going to go get the data. It says there's an error because it just doesn't recognize it, so it's creating a new database. It's now going to go talk to the Postgres uh, database. It's going to make a copy of it and then suck it in locally and then zip it up into a nice package, which might be the biggest data set we've tried to do. No, it's not actually the biggest one. Um, but yeah, we'll, so we'll, see, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. But um, it's, yeah, okay, there we go. Great. And so now I'm just going to copy this ID. I'm going to go to the zip file. We'll see how big it is. Um, is that the time? Yes, that's the time. It's 6.7 megabytes uncompressed. We'll open it up. It's uh, 58 megabytes, right? There's just like one game, and now I'll, we'll just peer into it. It's interesting because it's actually big enough that it's like I'm not sure that we're, we're going to be able to just like directly peer into it. Um, I'm going to open up the, um, the node table so you can see how many people there were. Um, and we'll see that here there are. There, there's the environments, which is like just the actual grid counts as a node here. And then there is one, two, three, four, five players. So this is a pretty small table that just says when, the, when they joined uh, and what their number was. But some of these tables are quite big. Like this info table, this is the 58 megabyte table that contains every 50 milliseconds the entire game state. And it's interesting because like, this is big enough that like, I, don't, like, I probably can't just like, open this in a text editor. It's going to maybe complain. I don't know. Um, yeah, you can see it's, it's loading. It may or may not load. But you know, you, we've definitely seen over the past couple of days lots of tools that can certainly handle data of this size. And um, and size that's much larger. We're still we're still not at anywhere. We're still not at big data. Um, okay. So just as a quick recap of what we've talked about, we talked about algorithms as experiments, experiments as algorithms. We've talked about inserting entire experimental pipelines into algorithms. We've talked about automation and how automation is useful both because it allows you to do experiments of a size that you could just really never do in a brick and mortar lab or even do um, on the internet with, uh, without automation. Um, and we've also talked about how automation is quite useful for uh, reproducibility of both your analyses and perhaps even of the experiments. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved in the creation of Dowinger. We have actually quite a few of them in the room today, um, including uh, Tom Griffiths and M. Pacer and uh, Vishal Lal and Alex Paxton and Jess Hamrick. And, uh, uh, so thanks a lot. And uh, thanks to like uh, funding sources like the NSF and uh, DARPA. And uh, yeah, it was great giving this. And I uh, had a nice time at the workshop. I promised I would hand it back to Alex, and so there you go. Okay, um, so that's uh, that's about it, everyone. So thank you so much for making this such a wonderful event, for being here, and for sharing all of your perspectives and your questions and everything. Um, it's been an absolute joy to, to be here for. Uh, can I ask, what you want to say? I just wanted to say I think we should all give Alex a round of applause. <laughs> single event, we would love to make the case 